Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Urkelhammer. So today I welcome back Ben Johnson from Captive Aquatic Ecosystems. What's going on there, Ben? What's going on, Keith? Thank you so much for having me on. It is uh, my pleasure, dude, to have you back on. Always love having you on the uh, on the show. We're, uh, I was saying right before we went on the uh, live here, man, that background is I, I can barely see you because you got some waves. You got the beef podcast uh, curtain behind you. You got you got this uh, Bengals cap. You got the. Uh, the flowered shirt you got the long hair it's you got a lot of go a lot going on there man i'm sort of a nature artist so <laughs> it's just i'm just letting my freak flag fly <laughs> surprise surprise right <laughs> so for those that don't know uh ben he's an aquarium maintenance expert who has many types of clients did, did you want me to say uh the, the high end the low end or were you striking that part oh the, the it's all <laughs> high end all of it uh, his company's based in Houston, Texas. He has spoken at MACNA plus some other conferences and shows. I think you're going to be speaking at uh, Reefstock too, right? Oh, you have. I'm, you have. But if it was up to you, I will. <laughs> yeah, I spoke at Reefstock. I spoke at Aquashella five times, yeah, four times. Yeah, so very uh, in-demand speaker, Ben is. Um, he has strong opinions about how to run a reef tank and what should be done, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, his beliefs. Uh, but mainly we're going to be talking about tank maintenance and husbandry. And um, he also co-hosts the Reef Beef podcast with Rich Ross. And there's a lot of beefers in the audience there, dude. Uh-oh. I can't see what they're saying. So I, b before we start, Keith, I apologize for any vomit, any spilled beer, <laughs> any whatever is going on in your chat section. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a lot of conversation happening here. I just see a lot of beef beef. I see a bunch of steaks. And um yeah. So this should be a good show, dude. And um before we start chatting, I want to thank the sponsors, both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I appreciate these companies supporting the live stream 
And I appreciate all you folks out there tuning in. As always, please drop your comments and questions in the chat. We'll do the best to get to them. Todd from Champion Lighting and Supply, three three beefs. Um, Reef Beef Podcast, Beef Beef. Maybe that's rich. Oh, look at that, oh. man. You got some fireworks going yeah. on. Two thumbs up. I didn't even know I could do The power <laughs> I wield didn't even. I guess I'm a wizard. <laughs> that's, hey, Keith, before we, yeah. before we even get started yeah. jim jim graham telegram he he sent me on a special mission because he said he's playing backgammon with his wife and he wanted me to croon for her for a second so he can find a way to cheat croon away man. so so this is for jim's wife and i was just gonna say strangers in the night exchanging glances <laughs> okay that's all that's it if, if you couldn't cheat in that amount of space then <laughs> i got nothing for you that was jim. his opening right there yeah, just Jim, just win, like, you know, win honorably. <laughs> you don't need to cheat. <laughs> don't be tricky. Don't uh, pull, don't yeah. have anything up your sleeve. Um, Sephead, Rich, it is. There we go. There, I, I, I'm confused, man. You got Sephead in the audience. You got Reef Beef Podcast in the audience. Uh, is that, um, who's who's the man behind the scenes again? You, got, you guys right. still uh, Mr. X or whatnot? It's like Fight Club. We're not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> and, and what was the guy's name at the end? Where they're all... It's like, I am Spartacus. <laughs> like, all the beefers are Spartacus. Telegram, I love you, Ben! Exclamation point. There you go. You did, you did him a solid. <laughs> I mean, I only gave him like a second worth of cheating, but maybe he hit a chip or something. <laughs> um, <coughs> dude is the... High Tide Aquatics in Oakland. Dude is the oh, dude, Ken yeah, Kenny. Dude is the sun in the Texas brighter than ours. Look at that sunburn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's already like summer here. We've skipped. It was uh, eighty something degrees today. Eighty something <laughs> degrees. Yeah, you know, we, we almost got to sixty here in uh, in Vermont, but we're supposed to get rain tomorrow, and then the temperature is supposed to drop forty degrees overnight. Yeah, by Thursday, we're into the 50s, which is so chilly for Houston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, all right, man, we were talking before the uh, the live about uh, something else, and that was um, Reefstock. You're going, right? I am going. I don't have a speaking engagement, but uh, we're going to have a meetup on Saturday at 9 a.m. in the speaker room. That's, that's maybe a little early, but it is what it is. And we're just going to meet up, and Jason Langer makes those badass yeah, cookies. Yeah. He's in and, the uh, he's so in he, the chat. Snowman. He he reminded me. It's Snowman is the um, person behind the uh, Reef Beat podcast. Yeah. Well, but that's you know who knows <clears throat> who all's behind Reef Beat podcast. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like a, a it's like Cobra. It's like a multinational <laughs> conglomerate of evildoers. So you're you're going, and um, you know people have been asking me if I'm going or whatnot, and and so I told you I was going to explain my rationale um, before, and it is a sex change operation that uh, yeah. so I'm fessing up right now. That's the reason why I can't go. No, it's um, yeah. it's it's uh, it's a crazy quest that I'm on. So I'm a big uh, skier, right? Oh, okay. you know I uh, I ski all the time, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm on a quest to ski every day of the ski season. And I started back on November 5th. I have not missed a day. I am trying to make it an immaculate ski season, hit 200 days, and not miss a day from November 5th till probably like the end of May. Are you trying to break like a Guinness Book of World Records? <laughs> maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe there is something I could break like uh, most consecutive. Monster quads. <laughs> yeah, legs. I guess. I don't, you know, so, um, so that's my dilemma is like, if I go, <clears throat> if I go to Reefstock in Denver, I could ski Friday morning here, grab a flight and get, uh, get to Denver like by, you know, late afternoon, but it's Saturday. It's Saturday. I got to try to like find a way to ski. And if there's anybody in the Denver area that knows this stuff, then please help me out. But my understanding is that on a Saturday morning, if I try to go from Denver to like Arapaho Basin, which is like one of the closer uh, ski resorts out there, I'm probably going to hit a shit ton of traffic, which um, 
you know, is not, I'm, I'm only looking to do like one or two runs and then get back to, uh, to the, uh, to the, you know, to the conference. So, uh, if anybody has any ideas on that, I think I would need to like leave at three o'clock in the morning on Saturday to, to make it out there, to be able to ski that one day. So I'm, I'm just saying that I am insane and that's my insanity is, uh, the reason why, um, I'm probably not going to be making it out to, uh, to restock unless somebody can tell me otherwise that there is a, it's a, it's doable. I sort of feel like if you were motivated enough that you could do some kind of crazy trip where you could ski from your house all the way to reef stuff. <laughs> you could mix it up with snow skiing versus like the alpine like travel. And you could even go like water skiing. I feel like you could ski all the way from your house to Denver. That, that would be a Guinness Book of World Record uh, feat, I think, if I was able to do that. But um, so that's my... Uh, that's my insanity. And, um, yeah, so I, I got to decide tomorrow what the hell I'm doing. But so, yeah, enough of that. That's my motto for life. I got to decide tomorrow what the <laughs> hell I'm doing. So, all right, some folks don't know what your day job is, maybe. Explain to us what captive, uh, you know, aquatic ecosystems is all about. I know we, we had you on back a couple of years ago solo and we, we we talked all about it but just give us a quick refresher in terms of what you're doing man in terms of your day job so so real quick i i started professionally in this industry in 1995 out of high school um blah 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 you take you you get to 2004 the whole time i've been in the industry mm -hmm. in 2004 i was a zookeeper at the houston zoo and i was like it was fun ish but it doesn't pay much a zoo job and so I started doing uh, maintenance on the side. And after two years of doing that, I was like, man, I am literally making as much when I get off of work of when I'm at work. Mm. So I just made an old move and it was scary, but I've been self-employed doing this since 2004. So it's just running around, you know, moving tanks, cleaning tanks, you know, installations, all things in between so all day long i clean aquariums fresh water and salt water right not just salt water what what what, per, what percentage is fresh uh, it ebbs and flows right um <clears throat> but i would say it goes anywhere from one third fresh yeah about one third fresh i mean l literally let's be honest i'm a business yeah and so if it's in a glass box, I'll take a swing at it. It's just I have, you know, minimum prices to come out and do stuff. Yeah. And if you'll pay minimum prices, I really don't care what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, you'll you'll tackle any uh, any kind of situation, even if it's a tank that's like in need of massive um, restoration. Yeah. And, and it's just I mean, after having done this for so long, like, you know, you you separate the wheat from the chaff after a while. So it's like. You know, in the beginning, if you want to do this for a living, you sort of have to take on everything that comes your way. Well, that was a long time yeah. ago. I've sensed not do that. So basically, if you come to me with a beat up aquarium, we can make it better. Um, and not to sound elitist or something, but I mean, you know, my the 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 threshold for to get me to rehab your tank is it's up there a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But I, I only take on things where. You know, the, the the favorite thing that we do as aquarium professional installers is I, I just want a person that doesn't have anything and they, they just want a lottery. <laughs> I can make it all mine. But let's be honest, the most of the business we get is fixing other people's crap. You know, how how important is it to have a um, a tank owner that's actually cooperative, you know, in the, in the sense that they're going to be willing to do something. I'm, I'm assuming that you've got some clients that um, are completely hands off and then you've got some clients that want to be hands on. Totally. I call and I even I even have one of those clients, I think, watching on the live stream <laughs> and uh, we, him and I have a real honest relationship. And so most of my clients are not hands on. And in most cases that it's highly annoying when they try to be hmm. this, this particular guy doesn't bug me at all. He's, uh, he's, uh, he, he can remain, he can remain nameless, but he's having fun ordering some crazy stuff. Hmm. So corals he, and fish and you're talking about, he, he's, it's, it, he likes the corals a lot, but he knows less about the corals. He's more into the fish. I mean, he's already has a black tang, you know, he's got a 
Oranai tilefish, mm. you know, and he's looking at stuff like cherry anthias and he's looking at a feminist ras and he's looking at some crazy stuff, you know. So I find that challenging and interesting. And he doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't, we discuss things that we're doing with the tank, but he, you know, as properly so, he defers to me. We don't argue about it. I'm, you wouldn't want to sit there and argue with me because it's, I don't have time to do that. But, you know, we discuss all the things that involve the aquarium. But the, my, the, 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 the type of client I'm regularly going for is, I know this sounds rude, but just write a check and get out of the way. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, I guess uh, it, it, it's going to cramp your style, right? If there's going to be too many uh, cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. Well, and being a, being a business, unfortunately, I have to sort of look at it like, you know, time is money. And if I'm going to your house and we're just arguing over whether you should have a trident or what sort of lights or like you, I would do that if you're on the clock. Right. But you don't want to pay such and such amount of money just to sit there and argue with me. Yeah. So a lot of times it's just people like, uh, oh, we, me and the husband decided we want an aquarium. So I show them what I do. I show pictures. I'm like, oh, that's great. And they just, they, you know, usually people get out of my way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Matthew Masati is asking a question that um, <clears throat> is an interesting question. Hey, guys, I want to upgrade soon to a 100-plus gallon uh, aquarium. What tank brand <clears throat> you see out there that you recommend, Waterbox? Um, Planet. Yes, I was going to say um, you're a Planet Aquarium guy, right? Um, I, I totally understand how AIOs are super <laughs> super popular nowadays. I mean, you got Waterbox, you got Red Sea, you got Cade, you got uh, uh, Innovative Marine, yeah. you know, yeah. stuff like this. And, and I totally get that because if you're talking about if you want to plan it and you want someone to custom plumb it and you want this and – I mean, by the time you're done with me on stuff like that, you're talking about 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 plus, yeah. you know, so I get some people that attempt to do it on their own in the beginning. You just get a water box and the plumbing's already there. You get a Cade, the plumbing's already yeah. there. Now, me as a custom installer, I still see issues with those systems and I'm, I still want to choose this skimmer or move this baffle here, you know. So you're, you're kind of tweaking I, that uh, turnkey stuff. Yeah. In 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 my head, the best thing is when you let me make a hot rod and I do it all from scratch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you do like Planet Aquarium, so you never go with a uh, with a custom tank builder. Well, Planet is oh, a they custom are? tank I, builder. I didn't know that. So you could actually customize that tank, have whatever dimensions you want, and that's one of their main. That's really their main shtick, to be honest. Huh. Okay, I didn't realize. I thought they had um, you know like turnkey uh, systems that. Um, that you can purchase, but I didn't realize that it's so, so if you want to like get an, you know, external overflow box or Euro, Euro bracing, you could do that. Oh yeah. They have a, the, my favorite one that they make is a schedule 80 PVC bottom. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you can like armored corners, you can get Euro bracing, you can get, you know, do you, do you find that, um, and, and I guess you've never seen one of those, uh, fail, but I know I, I, um, I use a, uh, a tank builder that I don't think is around anymore. And he was local in New Jersey. He always told me that um, like a PVC bottom is not a great idea because it's it's you're putting together two different materials and there's a, a bigger opportunity for a seal to break if you're doing glass to PVC or something. You don't you don't believe that? I can talk about this now because it was a very long time ago. But in the 90s, I used to work for um, the original fish gallery in Plano, Texas. And officed in with them was a company called Liod, Living Interiors of Dallas, that Oceanic had made. And um, my boss on that side was Tom Hudson. And he was he, he had been worked for Oceanic. He, for 14 years, he was in charge of, of uh, um, research and development. And he had told me way back then, way back then, that there's a formula of this chemical that you put on PVC to make it mate with silicone and glass. And it had formaldehyde and other stuff in it. I don't, you know, it's like a trade secret, so I'm not trying to yeah. blah, blah that here. But um, I'm not trying to be an a-hole, and I'm not trying to necessarily dispute that guy because I don't make aquariums. But trust me, man, they, they, that sounds like someone that doesn't do that because they don't have that formula or something like that. They've been doing this for decades. It's That's not a thing. They know how to join glass and PVC together, no problem. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm I'm not uh, <clears throat> I'm not professing to to be the uh, to be the expert on that stuff. I, you know, it's uh, it, it it you know. What you're saying makes sense to me in terms of if you've got something figured out in terms of bonding those two different elements, then um, there you go. If it worked that well, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, just looking at some other comments in the chat. What about uh, sumps, man? Does Planet make sumps? They do. They they have an in-house thing, a <laughs> tide line. Okay. Um, I'm just I'm just a no bullshitter, so <laughs> my opinions are just going to fly out there. I'm not giant fond. Here's going to be controversial. Not only am I not super fond of a Tideline sump, I'm not super fond of sumps, period. Sumpless. Not sumpless, but, and this is going to irk some people, <clears throat> there's, there's often times that I will just use a glass tank and I will build my own baffles into it. Um, it depends on the budget, but if I had a huge budget, boom, we're just, we're going with MRC or Synergy or someone like that, you know, but if it, if it's not, you know, and Hey, especially in this time with the economy's down, like, you know, people say they want an aquarium, a custom aquarium until they start talking to me and the prices more often than not floor a lot of people. And so I, you know, after all these years, I just know, you know, People that make sumps are going to say, that's not true, Ben, but, you know, there's ways that you can scrimp when you're trying to fit something into a budget someone has. And, hey, you don't need the craziest sump when yeah. you're trying to do that. Yeah. You know, I can show you bomber looking tanks that just have glass tanks down below. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I have the um, the Royal Exclusive Dream. I got two Royal Ex Exclusive oh, yeah. uh, Dream Boxes. You know, they're PVC made and they're bulletproof. And, you know, I'm sure I'll have them for as long as I want to have them. Um you know, so I'm mean, yeah. I mean, you, there, there's a whole bunch of different options that you could do for sumps. I think you know the one thing that I noticed when I was shopping for sumps out there, it seems like, you know, in the states, there's there there didn't seem to be a lot of um, a lot of options. I mean, there were some options, but that um, you know, at the time when I was shopping a few years ago, it just seemed like it was limited. But what you're saying makes total sense. When the price of if you follow it, the price of acrylic has just gone insane. Oh yeah. From haven't haven't been doing this for you know a couple decades plus like just watching the price of acrylic so you know and there's i don't want to speak for them but i'm saying companies like <clears throat> synergy they've they've tried to like look these are the models that we have and when you call or at least it was uh, years ago tell me if i'm wrong but you know now if you call synergy and ask them to make a custom one it's like Ugh, they're not sure if they want to do oh, it really? You know. Yeah, Paul Great Bearded Reef says I got a nice Synergy Reef uh, TS60 sump. Damn expensive, but not as expensive as the Royal Exclusive. Yeah, my my my, uh, my freight cost for the Royal Exclusive Dream Box of both of them, man, it was like I don't even want to say what it cost me. You know, it was close to not not close to what the cost of the sump was, but it was uh, before freight costs really shot through the roof after COVID. Uh, that too. Look, I'll tell you something real quick of why I'm not super in love with a Tideline sump. And it, it's, it seems minor, but it really irks me. So in Tideline where the drains come in, they do that old school thing where it's a PVC coupling male thread and an O-ring and then a small hole. And then they have a female couple on the other side. And listen, you, you know, anyone come on the chat and tell me otherwise. I've been around stuff like that for almost 30 years and I don't care how you do it. Those end up getting salt creep all around them because it's not a bulkhead. Whereas Synergy and these other companies, MRC, they they cut that hole and they use a bulkhead. You know, Tideline's trying to save space, but they drive me nuts because, you know, people manu manufacture things. Well, I'm the schlub that goes and works on them. <laughs> so I don't like it when people say, oh, no, the reason we do this is because, okay, look, I work on them. And it gets like salt creep everywhere. Even when you go tighten them and you do this or that, it's just they're messy and gross. I don't like that part. <laughs> There's there's some funny things going on in the chat here that uh, um, out about. <laughs> um, Chris Carney says MRC does a glass PVC uh, tank, and uh, they do the sumps as well, right? Some high end MRC, extremely sexy stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, talk to us about hard plum versus um, soft plum. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm glad you I'm going to have another unpopular opinion saying that um, I actually like soft plumbing. Now, that doesn't mean that I prefer soft plumbing. Um, I would say that I prefer hard plumbing, but 
I would also prefer if when you come to me with a budget that you have space in your budget for me to hard plumb. If you don't, I'm not going to cut into what I'm trying to make just to give you hard plumbing and I'm paying how, for the hard How much plumbing. extra time does hard plumbing for you take versus soft plumbing? It depends. It, oh, versus soft plumbing? It depends how intricate yeah. it is, but plumbing itself can sometimes take an entire day or more. I spent like a freaking week, you know, plumbing each of my systems, hard plumbing, but they're, you know, excuse me, it was pretty elaborate plumbing and all that stuff, but... Um, when you factor in like mistakes and running to Home Depot or ordering in, or yeah, it gets crazy. Yeah, yeah no, it is it is nuts. Now, I'm very specific with soft plumbing in that there's things about it that most people do wrong, and then they say, oh, soft plumbing sucks, okay? Uh, I cannot stand vinyl tubing. For for me, it was it's all about silicone tubing. Mm. Um, at one time, the the only place I knew where to get decent silicone tubing of that diameter was BRS. But since then, they, there's a, a brand Feelers on Amazon that I that I like a lot. Um, but uh, whether you get it from BRS or Amazon or wherever, just thick thick silicone tubing. You know, three quarter inch internal diameter, one one quarter. But here's another thing. You can't use, you don't use soft plumbing for a drain line. It, soft plumbing does not work good for a drain line. That's negative pressure. You'd want to use soft tubing on positive pressure or return line. Right. So I guess, you know, the, one of the advantages of the, uh, the soft plumbing is that you don't have a lot of like 90 degree elbows or 45 degree, um, you know, connectors and all that stuff. So you're probably going to get better flow. I guess the disadvantage yeah. is that it's not going to be as let's say permanent, um, more, it, I guess it'll be more bulletproof versus the soft plumbing. I mean, do, do you ever see that though with the soft plumb tanks that you've done? Has there been any issues in terms of over time, like more, more leaks happening with the soft plumbing versus the hard plumbing? See, and that's my problem. And I'll argue about this all day long, um, is that it's vinyl tubing and vinyl tubing has only just, you know, vinyl braided tubing and vinyl tubing that you got from a big box store. That's garbage absolute garbage so what vinyl tubing does over time is it loses its elasticity it gets hard and sure then you could have you know if you push vinyl tubing over a barb and you know i used to carry a, a paint removing like heat yeah. gun so you soften it up push it on there put a stainless steel or a titanium hose clip you know you go down the road a couple years well you know it's you can't even ding pull that thing off of there right but with uh, silicone tubing, it remains pliable all the time, and for for years and years and years, it doesn't it doesn't turn rigid. And I think that rigidity is the problem over time. That makes total. You know, I, I didn't know that. You know, I I um I've I've used like um final tubing to um you know feed uh, reactors and and things like that. You know, it's just kind of like secondary equipment. I not not for the main plumbing in my systems, but um. That's that's a great uh, tip in terms of the the silicone tubing. Uh, Big ES is wondering why um, why 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 should you not be using soft plumbing for a drain? Um, it because a drain is is pretty much negative pressure, so it will collapse on itself. <clears throat> the uh, the one thing about silicone tubing, great with positive pressure, but when you give it negative pressure, it'll it'll sort of suck in, and it it doesn't. It'll, it can kink and it can suck in. You, you just don't want that in that situation. Um, Telegram is, uh, I think, noting your little um, hearts that had been uh, shooting up. <laughs> he said, ben, oh, Ben's on the do? Mac or the iOS. Give us the heart. <laughs> how do I do the heart? There you oh, go. There how, how are you doing that, man? I just did this right here. I'm a, I'm a wizard, <laughs> Harry. <laughs> is, is the wife like uh, behind the scenes doing stuff to you or what? Oh yeah, I wish. <laughs> would be, that would be a reef bum first, wouldn't it? Whoa, yeah. I jeez. Okay. Yeah. What the emoticon yeah, for that? Wow. That would be interesting. <laughs> um what uh oh okay, so speaking of uh, hard and soft plumbing, what about overflow boxes? You know, there's a there's a lot of different ways to plumb an overflow box, you know. And um, I always go really simple with it, but there are what you know, Durso drain, and and um, I can't even think off the top of my head. The what? You ever seen those? 
Well, every time I talk about those, a lot of people I haven't heard of them. So, I mean, Durso's so old school. And back in the days, man, I've made a thousand Dursos. But, you know, I, I, I'll i sometimes tend to use, it's this thing, Maggie Muffler. And uh, it's like a black cap. It's sort of like a Durso in itself, but it's shaped like a bell. And they make them in one inch and one and a half inch. And you would just make a standpipe and just put this black bell cap on there. It's called a Maggie Muffler. Okay. Never heard um, of that. You you have to be aware of the gallons per hour that they can handle because if you if you not if you don't fall in that target area it can still slurp and make noise. Um, I would say that my that my favorite is you know like either the bean animal or the Herbie. Right, the bean animal. It, to, be with you, to be honest with you, like the bean animal is super popular, but and I don't know if this is just my my ex, you know long experience or what, but. I can plumb a tank and run a system where that emergency valve is just just never necessary. So I almost, you know, I, I, so I almost, you know, think that a, a Herbie is totally fine for me. I do like a, you know, a completely submerged drain and then the drain that you, you know, on the submerged drain you use the the gate valve to to close it up a little bit and make it go trickle out the other are, one. Are they all um well, you know, to a certain degree, you know, how bulletproof are these different types of drain systems? You know, uh, is one riskier versus the other? You know, are, are you like sacrificing, you know, um, I guess safety for silence, let's say? You know, you could have a loud Durso slurping away, you know, because you're, you, you know, and that could be a whole nother discussion, but you know how people try to jam so much gowns per yeah. hour around through the system. I don't find that necessary. You know, it's a it's a careful balance. It in in my head, I would say I'm I'm maybe trying to turn the the tank over. I'm a little old school. I always say three to five times in an hour. You know, a lot of times I might be on the closer to the three, but you know I've heard this discussed so many times. Really, if you pass the water through more times in an hour than what your skimmer's processing, that it's sort of pointless. Yeah. So you know, in my head, I believe like don't pass so much water throughout the system that you're making all this slurping and all this noise like this, you know, hey, pass it through a couple, a few times an hour and all the rigorous water movement you want to create with gyres and vortex and, you know, pumps, you know, internal circulation pumps. This old school thing like, you know, 15, 20 years ago where we were trying to pass water through the system like 20 times, like that's insanity. Yeah. No reason. That's risky. Yeah, right. No reason push the limits like that yeah i i just have straight up um drains i've got my two di display tanks i've got two drains um you know and that's that's about it one and one half inch bulkheads that drain into you know my sump they travel about 15 20 feet uh to to the sump and i got two return pumps and they go right you know it's, it's pretty simple that way and and uh you know, it makes a little noise, so it's not like, um, you know, the most, um, uh, you know, elaborate uh, setup, but it, it, it works for me. I got a top on my overflow box, so it, the lid kind of suppresses the uh, the noise, but um, I've never, ever had any issues with that that uh, sort of setup. So, But, you know, the, the popular, one of the popular ways where, like, uh, on a planet tank and other tanks, too, is you can get the, you can get the, like the two holes cut into the back, you know, big like two inch bulkheads or whatnot. And then that, at least we used to call them ghost overflows, yeah. but they have so many names now. They're like built on yeah. overflows back. Not not the whole full length ones like that, but the ones. So then you've got like the guard for the drain. And then you go in the back and there's usually like a bean animal type three holes. So one submerged, one trickle through and one uh-oh line. Right. But See, the, the thing I like about that scenario is, first of all, if you had the traditional full-length overflow, like snails, like uh, red-banded trochus do this a lot. Red-banded trochus can get over there. Uh, uh, um, you know, sea cucumbers can get over there. Stuff can jump over the overflow and get into there. In that other style where the drain part has the teeth but it's enclosed, like something would have to get past there, then it would have to get past the channels, then it would have to get into the drain. And I just think that's one of the most foolproof ways. Right. I mean, you mentioned that there's a lot of things that could potentially can get into um, overflow boxes and, and uh, you know, block stuff, which can be a, uh, a big uh, issue. And, 
you know, and that's one thing that I always, um, you know, say in terms of like tank maintenance, that's something I've kind of like added to my weekly routine is to make sure that the teeth in my overflow boxes are um, clear of debris. Yeah. You know, Coraline, even uh, green star polyps, even yep. a dead fish that stuck to yep. it, even, yep. you know, all sorts of stuff. Algae. Um, Jam is asking. <clears throat> so Ben. Uh, Jam is saying, Ben maintained some large systems. What's his thoughts on closed loops? Should they make a comeback? Hmm. I'm not in love with closed loops, but you get to a certain size, and, and it's it's hard to get around that. Um, you know, I could arbitrarily throw a number out there, but it sort of depends. Here's another thing from my experience. It seems like the taller a tank is, the more closed loop might be more important. Um, because I, I've had, I've done some systems that are like three foot tall, four foot tall, stuff like that. Mm, and that's tall. It's only so much you can do with some other internal circulation pumps. But here's my word of advice. If you're doing a big tank and you want to do a closed loop, then you're, and you're doing a custom tank. That means you control what you're telling the tank designer. So do not use abs bulkheads for a closed loop design your closed loop so it's using like hayward schedule 80 bulkheads yeah. now i've been around tanks that have closed loops that have abs bulkheads if you know how to add if you know how to put on a bulkhead no big deal this or that it's just it's going to be a weak link and if you think that that and if you imagine that that entire tank could drain down to that point just just design it with a stronger bulkhead. I, you know, they scare the crap out of me, man. I, um, I've never had a closed loop in, in any of my. And then you go. To the pump. What's that? Then the volume, the pump volume could blow out. I, it, it's there's just, just so many things that can go wrong with it, and and you know, like you said, I mean, if that bulkhead goes or what have you, then you're screwed. But but Keith, here's the problem. <clears throat> then you're looking at a thousand gallon tank, fifteen hundred gallon tank, stuff like this. It's sort of hard to get away from a closed loop. Yeah, you know, I guess the, the, the good thing is that we have a lot more options these days in terms of recirculating pumps inside the tank. It's just, I guess, it's a bit of an eyesore and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and I'm definitely guilty of that in, in terms of having a lot of MP40s and MP60s, the Ecotech, you know, in my tanks that are visible. And, and uh, you know, I had Steve Wiest on as a guest uh, of a number, number of months ago, and, and uh, that dude is brilliant. You know, we, uh, we talked about his... Um, Basically, he, he has designed his uh, his tank where there are no visible pumps, wires, mm -hmm. or plumbing, which is just freaking that, amazing. Uh, you'll get me. Uh, it's sort of corny, but I am so Team Steve Wiest because uh, here's the artist side of me. And I, you know, sometimes I tell this to potential clients when I'm talking to them because I, I want to impress upon them that I know what I'm doing and I've been doing this a long time. But one, one of the sort of cheesy things is I tell people, it's like, if, I'm, if I design an, an aquarium and I want to be proud of it and this and that, I really want you to look in there and like, damn, I'm looking in the ocean. Damn, I'm looking into a river. I don't want cords. I don't want pumps. Yeah. I don't want – sometimes it's inevitable and you have to see that. But I want you to look into one of my tanks and get lost. And the second you see a cord, a heater, a pump, like you, it brings you back to, oh, I'm looking into an aquarium. So if you can avoid that – but – Hey, that's the eternal conundrum because there's aesthetics versus function. Right. And right. and you could aesthetic the hell out of it and the tank just doesn't do well. Right. So right. you really have to use your noggin like Steve does to 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 get that function in an aesthetic way. Yeah. No, he yeah. has it he has it all figured out in that sense. So uh yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just you know, so in, in terms of the uh, the closed loop, it's it's something that I think was used a lot more years ago and and uh, you know, like um, um, that that viewer was saying that you know are they going to make a comeback? I don't know. I, you know, I I I think it's a it's a big risk. It's a risk that you're Again, taking. It's sort of arbitrary number, but if you have a tank under 500 gallons, like there's no reason to think about a closed loop. There's like you just said, there's so many more you know gyre pumps and and uh, uh, what are those like cannon? You got tons of. Like, you know, powerful tons of cannons. I can't remember I what those ones them. that are. I used to have them. Yeah. Man. Those things were like the bombs. And on and on and on. And then, it, you know, and a lot of that comes down to your rock structure that you put in there. You know, if you if you, if you you dump rock in there and it's dense, you're going to have issues. Yeah. But, you know, if you, if you have it, uh, you know, real open, 
and everything, and then you have strong flow, you can get that flushed out. Speaking of uh, oh, rocks, it's not circulation pumps. It's your it's your aquascaping as Speaking well. Speaking of that, what um, if if you were kind of given you know free reign in terms of designing a tank, do you favor more of the o open aquascape or do you kind of like um, not so open and 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 uh, I, I guess my question to you is, in terms of your aquascaping preferences, what are they? It depends what I want to do. Um, it's funny because the longer I've done this, like it sounds pretentious, but you know, more and more, I used to feel shy to say I was an artist, but I've been doing this for too damn long, and I am, in fact, an, an artist to some degree. That's up for for debate <laughs> of anyone that sees my stuff. Obviously, art's in the eye of the beholder. But I did this tank several years ago, and I just cleaned it today, but I built this, like, weird arch. I'll try to, you know, I, I could provide photos later. But I built this. This arch took me, like, two days or even four days. I used a Marco E400 and and all this stuff to, you know, and I'd build one part, and I'd wait a day and then build another part. It's this crazy arch. But uh, um, I've just been having fun with it and almost, like, challenging myself to make something different now. You know, you get to a point where you try to master the basics and then you're like, all right, now I just want to get weird and artsy. Yeah. And that's, that's what I've been doing yeah. now. I'll tell you here, I'll make a confession here, though. I used to poo poo on things like real reef rock and carob sea arches and stuff like that. And I recently did a couple tanks with those with big like 24 and 36 inch carob sea arches. Yeah. You know, and I sort of thought like, oh, you would just replicate that arch and it just looks stupid. Well. I turned it many different ways and I put like three or four of them in this tank. And by God, I did this aquascaping in like an hour, which ver which usually it takes me like a day or a couple yeah. days. And it looks badass. And I'm like, okay, you know, why break my back standing inside an aquarium when I can do cool stuff with this pre-made stuff? So I've, um, I have a tank with those arches pretty much exclusively the, uh, the carob sea, you know, um, life rock. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. that uh it's pretty much all arches and and uh yeah you're right man it's like some really cool stuff my my one complaint or i've got a couple of complaints with that rock is that it's not porous so yeah. you know a lot of the um you know that that kind of prefab dry rock is not very porous at all so that's a, an issue in terms of you know being able to colonize you know bacteria and all that sort of thing that's that's definitely a a drawback but um I also had some algae issues in in that tank with that rock, and I just don't know whether or not it was leaching phosphates or not. I, I blame it on the rock. What's Keith. that? Blame it yeah. on the rock. It's not my. It's not Who my freaking fault. Yeah, it's not me. It's, <laughs> damn rock. it's hard to say, isn't it? You know the whole. Well, you know, obviously, so I started doing this in '95, and is it for for any old timers watching. When I first got into the industry in 95, the most rock that you would get was Marshall Island. That stuff was cherry. Can remember back then? That was then? cherry. That was at Fiji. I don't know if it's one of those things that my memories on it are just more glorified, but man, it was just filthy with coralline algae. Yeah. Um, and then it was Fiji, and then it was dry rock, and now we've learned that dry rock is, you know, tricky uh brent jones thank you so much for that super chat really enjoy the podcast keith enjoy a beverage on me you're awesome too ben hey hey, hey give give keith more super chats come on <laughs> you ain't doing this for free <laughs> yeah we got to make a living right <laughs> yeah us, us podcasters got to stick together keith how dare you make any sort of money you should be just this free, Do it for free <laughs> yeah Okay, Chris from ACI, in. what's up, there, buddy? Uh, they need to mix Chris. rock salt with the concrete, then soak it. Oh, that's cool. And then it dissolves out and leaves pockets. That's pretty yeah. cool. Um, uh, Jam is say, ta um, talking aquascaping, <clears throat> what's Ben's favorite adhesive? Um, if you're putting it together dry, I like uh, from Champion, the, what is that stuff called? Um, C, ah. I'm sorry, Todd. Todd's going to kill me. If Todd's in the chat. Oh, that new product? Yeah. Oh. N now, Todd's going to get mad at me, but I don't I don't like it when it's wet. It's For me, it's difficult to work with. Todd has a specific way to do it, and Todd can, you know, speak to that better. But, um, man, when you're using it when, it, when things are dry and he has it in a caulking tube, I love it. It's real tacky and sticky, and it dries hard as a bone. Um, that's... That's going to be one of my favorites. Um, I'm not, 
I do still kind of like uh, Marco Rock E400. SeaTac. C- uh, he says it's SeaTac. C-tac. Sorry, Todd. SeaTac. <laughs> but uh, Marco Rock E400 is not bad. Um, um, I got some hom- homies at Okeanos that use uh, this epoxy, and, and Richard uses it too. Gem something or something gem? Someone in the chat will say. It's like an epoxy putty yeah. type sticky stuff i've used um <clears throat> the uh the mark no, so i've used a couple of things I've, I've used like this jurassic gel and accelerator and i got up through oh. brs and uh that's worked well for me um back in the day for many years i used epo putty because uh on on uh, uh oh what was that uh that forum what was that old original reef forum? central reef central there was that uh, guy from Thailand, uh, Ching Chai Ukrathom, and uh, he yes, had that badass. Like, yes, that he... guy had an incredible tank. Well, yeah, and w- way back then, I asked him, I was like, what did you put that together with? And it was Epo Putty. And then it turns out a friend of mine, James Strauss, sold it. And I used to use it. And it, it's not like those normal two-part putties. It was much more tacky. It felt like wet bubble gum. And when it dried, man, I swear, it was like bone. And you could take something that you put together with EPO putty, EPO putty. You could take something you put together with it, throw it on the floor, and the rock would break. But the EPO putty wouldn't wouldn't break. Um, title guards, maybe this is Than. It would be nice to have much more porous rock. Yes, yep. for sure. Um, Ooh, you want a controversial opinion? What's that? You want a controversial opinion? Uh, yeah, why not? You're like, no, <laughs> I don't like Marco Rock. You don't like Marco Rock? Just don't. It's too dense, too heavy. <clears throat> I you know, you know, I don't just, want to pile on Marco yeah. Rock, but I I didn't have a great experience with it myself. It was it was definitely the Rock's fault, not my fault. So uh, yeah, nothing to do with <laughs> Reaper syndrome. <laughs> it was no, it was not user error at all. <laughs> it was the tubing, it was the pump, it was the lights. The moon was in that my eyes. That dude's tank you're talking about in uh, in what was Thailand? Thailand. Uh, yep. He that was like he had that tank in a restaurant. It was like some ginormous tank in like the skinny room, but it was like the most kick-ass reef tank I'd ever seen. I still maintain to this day it's one of the sexiest tanks I've ever seen still. Yeah, yeah. It, you, you know how it was. It had that sort of lounge feel, and it had a, like yeah. a low-length white leather bench, and it was floor-to-ceiling. The acrylic was like, I don't know, three yeah. inches, four inches. Exactly. It was nuts. And and actually, he didn't he didn't maintain it himself. He had the like Thai Reef Club. Oh, really? Come, and they used to come like almost every day, and it was like it just remained in a like an immaculate, because he had like a seafood restaurant. Right, right. He was also kind of a uh, a big foodie, or what? Yeah, or is yeah, yeah. And I met him at Acne, and I started talking a million miles a minute, and then I found <laughs> out he doesn't really speak English, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> And San Reefer says Sanjay uh, has a protein skimmer that was held with Epo Putty. I think I remember yeah. that. Epo Putty is still good stuff. I I didn't walk away from it for any particular reason. Is it? It is a little. I guess it's gotten pricey. What about for but... uh, putting sticking frags on rock work? Is that does that work well for that? Super super glue all day super long. Glue. I you know I have had bad experience with the uh, with super glue. I I just um. I have to hand it to my co-host Richard. Um, I used to hate super glue for for so long, and then Richard showed me the way that he he thinks he invented it, and maybe he did. I have no <laughs> idea. But once I tried his way, it blew my mind. And so hold it, on. What, I'm, what's I'm the not, methodology? I'm not even joking. You, it, it caused like a paradigm shift on on how I put together tanks, because you know, and someone in the chat or somewhere is going to be like, "No, I invented it. It's fine. Whatever." <laughs> so you take the super glue, and first of all. You don't be scared of the amount. You go in hard. So at first I put it on my finger, and I'll reach in the tank and where I want to put a frag. Any particular brand I'll, of super glue? It doesn't matter. Of course, we're sponsored by Polyp Lab, so maybe <laughs> Polyp Lab. <laughs> I recently started using, you know, Seachem came out with one. It's it's nice. What you about know? Gorilla Super Glue? Um, I got my, my client that's watching this uses Gorilla. I didn't like it because it... it the, at least the one at his house, it seemed to separate a little bit, and it was like it was a little liquidy, and I was a hard time like getting it out of the tube. Okay. But uh, so you you dab the 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 super glue on the the where you're trying to put it, 
and really sort of work it with the water and work it and then, you know, clean your finger off. Well, then you do the same to the whatever you're trying to glue onto there. And then you mate those together because it's almost like concrete that that, you know, in that if I just take something I want to glue a frag and I put super glue, a fat water super glue and push it onto a rock. That's just it just doesn't work because super glue cyanoacrylate loves cyanoacrylate. So if I create that little cyanoacrylate pad there and then get some cyanoacrylate on the other thing and maybe even do some more on the other thing Richard does, he'll he'll push it together, pull it apart, push it together, pull it apart, sort of get that water or whatever in there and then sort of work it back. And then I've I've glued the reason it caused a paradigm shift is because now I can glue favia frags onto the back wall. I can glue euphilias onto the bottom of arches. I can glue. I, I just have had not had any luck doing that. I've I've tried doing what you're talking about, but <clears throat> maybe it's the brand of glue that I'm using. Maybe I'm just using a cheaper um, brand of uh, of super glue, but. Uh, Todd, is ch Todd from Champions says, "Ask Ben why it's not a good idea to chew on glue tubes." <laughs> uh, I, uh, I had one day where I was trying to, you know, I get flustered because I'm trying to get in and out of a client. So I was trying to glue something, and I, I wasn't paying attention. I put the glue in my mouth, and I freaking got glue all over the front of my teeth, and I glued part of my lip shut. <laughs> And then Oops. I got mad and I put it in my pocket and I glued my pocket <laughs> shut and I was like, I'm just going home. <laughs> but it was it was weird. So let me tell people out there that do this. I was concerned <laughs> about getting super glue on my teeth because it, you know, it's just driving home, like licking my teeth like a meth head. <laughs> but I was concerned like what that would do. Well, it just took like a day. It just came off. It comes off. Yeah. yeah you know, so you stick it in your ear or whatever. It'll, it'll, you know, eventually it'll uh, work its way out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, title gardens, we order cases of dollar store at a time. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. It is crazy. Cause I always wonder why, you know, someone comes out with a, this is our super glue. And I'm like, what the hell? Oh, triple distilled. Oh, whatever. You know, I try to look at the price cause it, it feels like bullshit, but like, like when I recently got the Seachem one and I was using it and, but it's not like I would spend a lot more just but just to use that but it did have some other weird consistency where that i liked it it wasn't so runny you know it's pretty it's pretty cool i like i like that one turtle but i wouldn't spend a whole lot of money on turtle reef it definitely makes a big difference in doing that um used to struggle at it i found the bsi ice gel works the it's best I, I i haven't had good experience with that stuff i don't know man i'm like for some reason i'm just very challenged in terms of the uh i don't i don't love big tubes and that's why i like the poly polyp lab makes the little they call it like a grenade of the little tubes because if you give me a big tube of of, of gelatinized super glue i'll screw it up before it's all done with and then but richard told me and he's right you know i was cutting the back of it and and, and then you can you can make your own new holes but it's just I like using the pop lag because you know give it a couple squirts and then chunk it. I mean I have to say that you know when I make frags on frag plugs I use um, a combination of um, super glue and the um, the little um, putty. Um, what's that uh, stuff like? like kind of like a you know you, you put it together. It's like the um, pliable two part, two part yeah whatever it is and and so I use a combination of super glue and that putty to put frags onto frag plugs and that works great. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm struggling. I'm, I always seem to struggle in terms of planting frags onto the um, the reef uh, structure in my tanks. It's just um, next time I'm around you, I'll have to I'll, I'll stand behind you and like hold you from behind like ghost. <laughs> and we'll, we'll make some pottery together. <laughs> Give me a demonstration. Yeah, I'll run a penny up your mirror. You know, <laughs> some signs <laughs> that you're yeah. there. <laughs> Send me a sign, Ben. Ghost Ben. Yeah. Um, title gardens that is a nice thing about having the small containers we don't even put the caps back on when we're done yeah that's the whole thing right the uh, large containers are pretty much a waste of time because they're going to just get um, just uh, blocked up with the with glue and all that stuff I, I find myself even using the small containers and i'm taking little um, you know a, a little like pricking holes in it to 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 um, circumvent the uh the clogged tubing but i'm a giant fan fan I love Than. Than is the best. He was on a uh, couple of weeks ago. Um, he's a super. I, I know I'm. I'm not saying this because I'm on camera, but no, he's. 
you know, he wears like nice clothes all the time. And I think the first time I met him, I was a little intimidated <laughs> by that. And I'm, I'm telling you, he's super humble, man. Don't let, don't let those bow ties yeah, fool yes, you. Yes, he is. Have you ever been out to his place in Tidal Gardens? I haven't, but I need to, and I want to. Same here. Same. I heard you have to pass a background check. You have to do 50 push-ups. <laughs> you have to, you know, submit FBI profile, uh, you know, all that. That, uh, well, yeah, that, that, uh, that sounds like, um, that, that could possibly be the, uh, the case. Um. I tied Polo. Hey, Andrew Sandler, Polo Reef. Um, let's talk about something else, dude. Uh, so I was watching, you know, you guys recently did a video on Reef Beef. I think it was called The Day with Ben. And it was a, yeah. a, a day that kind of chronicled the day in a life for, for you in terms of yeah. handling your maintenance accounts. And I was watching that. And I noticed a couple of things in there I wanted to ask you some uh, some questions about. So, um, you know, one of, one of the uh, things that I saw that you were doing was you were taking this marine land polishing filter and using it to blow detritus and, and uh, you know, off the sand and the rocks and kind of get things elevated into the water column. I have the same kind of um, polishing filter, but I just wanted to get the, um, you know, from you in terms of why you do that, and how often you do that, and, and what's the purpose of, of doing that. Richard Ross turned me on to he that. He turned me on to it, too. Yeah. The funny thing is for like, uh, he'd been telling me about it for a couple of years and I was like, man, you know, I was, I'm, I'm like, I'm the professional aquarium maintenance dude. Like, I don't know about that. Then I finally got one and I used it and I was like, son of a bitch. Um, and it's not just any old one for me. It's important because it has that. I don't know how many microns it is, but that like micronic pleated, yeah. it's all about yeah. that. I don't give a crap about the pump or the housing or any of that. It's all about that pleated cartridge. So I, I have three of them. I use them all day long. I beat the crap out of them. Um, and so what I do is right before I clean an aquarium, it's the first thing I do. I, I set it in there and just keep it running the whole time. Because, you know, part of what I'm doing when I clean is aquarium, waft stuff, you know, clean the algae yeah. off, waft around my hands and kick everything up. You know, maybe I'm wet skimming. Maybe I'm doing this. All the while, this polishing filter is in there, you know, and then you could be concerned. What about cross contamination? Well, the first thing I do when I'm leaving is take it to their side of the house and blast it with fresh water. And then I fill the canister with fresh water, throw it back in the back of my truck. So certainly from that location to the next location, something's dying in the fresh right. water. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I find it, uh, it, it's great because I'll, um, I'll do the, you know, I'll, I'll basically what I do is I take like a maxi jet, um, power head, and I'll go around the rocks and uh, I've got all bare bottom tanks now and just get things off of the rocks and off the uh, the bottom of the tank, elevate into the water column. You know, yeah, if you got the um, the filter socks or the nylon filter socks, which is what I have, then that will certainly remove stuff. But I've uh, found that using that, um, that, that polishing filter just takes a lot of stuff out. A couple of hours, that thing is like dirty. Look, I'm, I'm, and, and again, Richard influenced me with this. Uh, I used it for so many years since I first started doing this to just a few years ago. I used to think that mechanical filtration was so important. Um, I had to hand it to Richard because he flip flopped my head the first time I went to go visit him. It was like a, you know, like a, almost like a paradigm. I was like, you know, he didn't care. And I was like, how can you not care about mechanical filtration? What kind of loser are you? You know? And so I went back home and I, on all my clients' tanks as a, you know, it's dangerous to experiment with your client yeah. tanks, but I took off the filter socks and this and that. And it made, there was no, there was no giant difference. It, the skimmers pulled out more after I took the mechanical off. So nowadays I feel like I do like fleece rollers. I don't find fleece rollers mandatory to use. I do like them. I don't necessarily think that they're totally necessary, but Think about, I think most of the people watching this could understand this for sure, but think about what you're doing when you mechanically trap debris. It still sits there and rots. Yeah. So if if you have a filter sock, unless you're changing or cleaning them once a day, every other day, which who in the hell would want to do that? You are not helping your water quality at all. Cool, you caught that fish turd. Guess what? It's still in the water. It's still rotting. So a fleece roller picks it up and out and removes it from the equation or not even running mechanical and, and allowing those pieces to get i've i've watched it it's funny you could take a, a tank with filter socks take the filter sock off and the skimmer pulls out just a little bit more you know so you're almost advocating 
no filter sucks. Now it's a little dangerous, and all this are all this is subtleties. And so I feel like that's another sort of thing is there's things that you would do to a young reef that you just set up. And then I think once you've, you know, once you've, whatever this means, once you've achieved being an advanced aquarist, you realize that there's things that you would do to a young reef that you would take off or change when the tank gets more mature. Right. That That's also like giving a shit about nitrate and phosphate. Yep. I have 10 year old tanks, 12 year old tanks, eight year old tanks, whatever that I take care of complete coral coverage. You can barely see the rock. I don't give two shits what nitrate and phosphate is. I don't even check really? it. Really? The corals just suck it up. I have tanks out there that I haven't checked nitrate and phosphate for more than five or six years. No kidding. Doesn't seem to matter. Because the you're not getting problematic algae and the corals look good? Yeah, but if I... See, it's all about the exposed rock structure. If If I put bright lights above a tank and it just has some frags here and there and I don't care about nitrate and phosphate, it's either going to go to the corals or the algae. Right. So it's that a, and the algae is going to take it and run with it and turn into a jungle. Right. You've got a, a, a five-year-old tank with, you know, no frags, but giant corals everywhere. You can barely see the rock. There's no algae to grow. The corals suck up the nitrate and right. phosphate. Right. And I promise you, once you get to that point, you cannot, you can, you can not give a shit about nitrate and phosphate. Right. To a degree. You don't want it sky well, high. So what do you do when you're setting up a system like a reef tank, a mixed reef tank, and um, in terms of uh, nutrient control, are you using macro? Are you uh, using GFO for phosphate? Just bigger water changes, skimming? I'm a water change guy. I like carbon a lot. I like Kolar Labs carbon. You know, obviously rocks, you know, 0 0.8 is great stuff too. Yeah. For, for me, the way I, I like to run the Kolar though, um, it's, you know, rocks is so fine. You have to do, do a reactor. And sometimes I don't do that. I just do these little pillows and baffles. And, and for me, and as a carbon user, like I don't use a lot of carbon. I use a small amount of carbon and I change it every time I'm there. I grab the pillow, throw a new carbon. How, how often are you changing out the carbon? Whenever I'm there, it doesn't like, matter. Uh, you know, whether once I'm every two weeks, once three weeks, week, every other week, yeah, you know, I just sort of arbitrarily do it as long as the water's clear. I don't, you know. I don't care to it. It could be a 200 gallon. It might if it was a 500. I might put two pillows of this in and a baffle. Um, but as long as there's a small amount being changed frequently, I def if you're using carbon, I definitely don't believe in some big hawk honking amount of carbon that you change once every three months. I don't think that that does crap. Yeah, it seems um, like you got to change carbon out every two or three weeks. Yeah, frequently and small. Yeah, um, big water changes. I use carbon. Um, this may be somewhat controversial, but I. I, I swear up and down about polyfilter. I don't use polyfilter in oopsie scenarios. I run them constantly in people's tanks. They tend to last about a month to two months. And when they get severely discolored, I chunk them and put a new one in. Polyfilter uh, is? Uh, what is that? Poly? Is that polybiomarine? Polyfilter? Okay. It's like a... I've been using them for like more than a decade. I've, Todd loves that I use them because I ordered tons of them and I use tons of them. Um, I don't like some of the wording on their packaging. I don't like some of their claims. I don't like some of the things that they say. But besides that, my decade of using them on freshwater and saltwater, I've had them clean and clear up tanks. And, you know, I've noticed to where they pull out organic materials. How do they get that on there? I don't know. I sort of thought that so it's like a pad and it okay. obviously has something sprayed on it i don't know if i'm correct in this but it seemed like whatever di resins made out of it seems like maybe they spray that on a pad i don't know if that's correct they make they make a bunch of claims on their packaging like you know less than water changes and all that Todd's sort of saying uh, poly biomarine and sprayed on di resin on a poly pad yeah yeah it seems you know again i don't know I don't think they're that controversial in my head. I use the hell out of them, and they help me a lot. Um, so water change, carbon, poly filter, and you know, and I don't like GFO anymore. I screwed up too many things with GFO. Well, it not only binds phosphate, but it binds other valuable trace elements. You know, so that's that's um, that's one downside to it. And you gotta you gotta yeah. I mean, there, there's risk because if you're using too much of it, then uh, you could really screw things up. Yeah. You know. Um, so you're not using macro at all for any tanks that you're starting off. You're not doing, doing any refugiums. Macro yeah. Macroalgae. I hate 
refugiums. Because <laughs> it's one other With, thing you got to take care of. And I, I also, you know, fight me, but they don't do shit. Now, oh, now, you're going to have okay. a lot of people disagreeing with that one, I bet. No, no, no. And, and, and I actually sort of disagree with myself there. You know, they're, they're pretty effective if you set it up right to, like, counterbalance. And, and, and they know, can be pretty much, like, hands off, too. I mean, let, let, uh, you know, if, if you got a well, good fuge set up, then. Like, well, like, with all this, you can set a fuge up in a real shitty, non-effective manner, and you could set a fuge up in a really effective yeah. manner. So it also depends. But nine times out of ten, a small refugium under a tank it just seems like a forgotten redheaded stepchild way to build up a bunch of crud, crud and crap and it's not doing anything. And here's the other thing. Unless you harvest it, you're not removing things. So, you know, when I see some people just sit there with like Kaido, Cheeto, whatever you want to call it, sitting there. I'm like, how often do you remove it? It's like, no, I just let it sit there. You're not removing anything. You're not removing any nutrients. The nutrients aren't gone until you take that out and throw it in the trash and it grows again. So yeah. if the if the... If the macros aren't growing, it's not removing anything. Right. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's 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 tough because you're growing macroalgae, whether it's um, a refugium or a um, an algae reactor or an algae scrubber. It gets a little bit more complicated because that algae is going to be taking in certain you know trace elements, so you will need to be dosing certain trace elements. So it it does definitely get a little bit more complicated. One of my systems, I'm running an algae scrubber right now, and my, one of my other systems, I'm not running anything. You know, I'm just doing the protein skimming, water changes, and um, you know, so on and so forth. So it it each system is like different, and 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 I I see scrubbers. That's a different animal. A ATS is a different animal. That's not a refugium, to to me, and. I'm not a big ATS guy, but I, it's one of those things like, I don't love mechanical filtration, but if I had to do it, I'd use a fleece roller. I don't love macro filtration, but if I had to do it, I'd do an ATS. Right. That sort of thing. On a, on a fish only system, I would hardcore use an ATS. On a reef system, you'd have to convince me a lot. I don't. Yeah. What about, you know, if the, if the game is removing phosphates, like in a, in a somewhat even consistent manner and you know jason or josh or anyone out there chris maybe anyone that uses ats's more than i do like i just sort of feel like you know you're you're harvesting some of the algae and chunking it in this i I'm, I'm saying this without any evidence or data but i sort of feel like that removal of nutrients you're doing a more jagged thing than i like there's certainly more there's more variables in play let, let, let's admit it. You know that's that's um, I, like I was saying. You're going to be dosing certain trace elements. Your nitrates and phosphates are going to be going up, going up and down, depending in terms of when when that stuff gets harvested. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It's more complicated. I think it's it's more well, complicated. And I'm one of these older. I'm one of these older people that it's like, you know, you wake up and people are adding nitrate and phosphate to the tank. I'm like, where the where the <laughs> hell where the hell did we go wrong? I've spent my entire career trying to remove nitrate and phosphate. You've never, you never dosed nitrates and phosphates to a Klein tank? God no. By Neptune's beard. Really? You never, you what? never really got into that modern reefing. Uh, wow. Look, it, it, this could be, you know, I could, I could come on the show as often as you want, but this could go into like, you know, thirty thousand foot view how someone runs a reef, but. You know, the viewers right now have to understand there is a difference between how I, as a service provider, care for a tank and how you, as a hobbyist, would. If I'm inside your house over an hour dicking around with stuff, un unless the, my pay structure reflects that, I'm wasting time. Yeah. So as a provider, a maintenance provider, I, I, it's this principle of letting good enough be good enough. I have to sit down and look at how I'm maintaining this tank in the hour to hour and a half that I'm cleaning it. And I have to tailor everything I'm doing to letting good enough be good enough. Like case in point, running carbon. You know, I yeah, I could like put a reactor on something, but then I got to grab that reactor, take it outside, clean it, blah, blah, blah. Boom. 10, 15 minutes later, I get it back on there. Or I can run it like I do in zipper, you know, little zipper things where I put Kolar Labs in there, rinse it. Throw it in a baffle. So then when I come up to a tank, grab that pillow, throw another one in. That's carbon. Done. Next. That's letting good enough be good enough. Is it is it the most efficient way to run carbon? 
No, it is not. But it's also not throwing it in the corner of the sump. It's throwing it in a high flow area. And that's letting good enough be good enough. Yeah, I see uh, Meckley and, and uh, Andrew uh, Sandler commenting. ATS, uh, Meckley said ATS saved us 80 plus hour, labor hours per week worth their weight in gold to me. And, and um, Andrew's agreeing. You know, those are cases where those guys have, you know, eyes on their systems 24 7, or at least have some set of eyes on the systems 24 7. So they can be very, uh, you know, in tune with that stuff. And, and that's just like what you're saying, man. It's like you can't be doing that. You know, that you're, you're only there for like a limited amount of time. And I totally get what you're saying. I mean, it's up to the client. You want to pay me a thousand dollars a day. Let's get it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sign, sign you up for mm -hmm. that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the other things I, I was going to ask you is like, do you ever get into the whole bacteria dosing thing to help with nutrient control? Have you ever dabbled in that sort of thing or any of these, uh, you know, kind of new, <laughs> let's call them like new wave, uh, you know, methodologies out there that have been more popular uh, lately? After, after doing this for so long, so many years, um, I like to dabble in things. I also like to sit back and see what happens. You can imagine after, what am I at now? I'm, I'm, I'm right around 30 years of doing this professionally. I've seen things come and go. So you, you, then you, you know, I'm not trying to like pull rank or sound arrogant, but you got to realize like if you had been doing this for five years, you've seen a fad or two go yeah. by. I've seen dozens of fads come and go. Pieces of equipment that people, oh, this is the wave of the future. And it even gets popular for a few years. Where is it now? No. You know? Uh, there was a thing a long time ago, this box called Enforcer, and you'd, you'd flow water through it, and it was supposed to, like, electrostatically, like, take nitrate out, you know? Enforcer. Enforcer. And that's the thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, where is that? Where is uh, solid carbon dosing, you know, doing biopels? I know some people still do it. I think it's garbage. You know, where, where do these things come and go? You know, they come and go. They come and go. So, And, and also, like I said, letting good enough be good enough. I can't get... Uh, um, your your actual question was, do I mess with the bacteria? I have some friends that do it hardcore. Do I do it? No, because I don't feel like I have enough oversight when it's not my aquarium in my house that if I uh, added something to there, you know, I'm not at that comfort level yet. But in things like that, I tend to sit back a little bit and see how that develops in the industry. And, you know, I don't want to jump on something, add it to a client's tank, get a phone call at 12 at night. You yeah. Know, I yeah. Bottom nutrients and I got to do, you know, you got to be careful. Man. Yeah. So besides like that Marine land poly filter or whatnot, have, have you changed anything, um, the, you know, recently in terms of your methods, the way that you reef? Mm, I'm constantly evolving like every day because, um, I run my company weird because it's me. I, I've had two employees over the years and I just, I'm be 100% honest with you. I don't know what I'm doing because I'm 48. You know, I'm getting older and older and I love what I'm doing. I'm in pretty good health and all that. But it's just like, but I do love it because I'm there cleaning a tank and it's me with 30 years of professional experience. And as I'm cleaning a tank, I'm like, how could I make this better? How could this run smoother? How could I do this quicker, but still do a good job? How, you know, so I'm constantly trying to figure that out. So, you know, it almost evolves every day, but I really, I sort of have it down to a science, but I'm, I keep my mind open, yeah. you know, it's going to be a better way. The, the polishing filter from Richard and, and also forsaking mechanical, those were some, some of the, even though those were, you know, it's a, a year or two old, it's sort of some later paradigm shift, uh, maybe wet skimming, but that's a whole nother subject. Uh, going back to mechanical filtration, if you were going to use mechanical filtration, what would be your um, pick fleece or nylon sucks? I use the see-through mesh, which are like nylon, uh, right? Is that uh, is that nylon? I know that's yes. what I'm using. Yeah, so I like those a lot. So here's the other funny thing, um, and I'm I'm gonna answer the question. But so you've got a customer system, and they used to have like their their you know their sump and everything was designed for you know old school socks. And then, um, you know, I'm tired of cleaning those socks, so I ran it without it. But then, like, a hermit crab or a fish got through, and I'm like, I still need to protect that, but I don't want socks. That's when, years ago, I moved to those nylon see-through yeah. mesh socks. 
Because, like, am I mechanically filtering? Not so much. I'm just trying to make sure stuff doesn't right. get through. I'm trying to control bubbles. I'm trying to catch if algae goes through, anemone goes through, a fish goes through. Um, but, see, that's what I was getting at is I can't necessarily – like, you know, people act like these clients are just crapping money. But it's not like, hey, can I change your entire filtration layout so I can run a fleece roller? Maybe sometimes they'll want to do right. that. <clears throat> Maybe they don't want to spend two thousand, three thousand, four thousand dollars. Yeah. So that's yeah. why in those situations, that <clears throat> hey, could we get a different sump? And I totally redesign your system. <clears throat> okay, if not, okay, then I just want to use these nylon filter socks there. So, but then when I set up brand new tanks, yeah, I would sometimes run fleece rollers. And that system's cool, where you just use a glass tank and then put your own fleece roller right there, because at some point. <clears throat> you don't want to use a fleece roller anymore. Just take the fleece roller out and do whatever you want. Kenny from High Tide Aquatics says uh, socks are for feet. Nylons just get the big stuff out. Oh, wait. I've, I've actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the fireworks. Oh, there you go. The hearts. Do this. I'm doing, doing it. That. You're doing it. You're doing it. Does uh, Jim, uh, te does Telegram need another diversion? <laughs> yeah. Are you going to croon again, here. man? For Jim, King glances. <laughs> cheat, cheat, cheat. Um, maintenance equipment, reef tank hacks, uh, reef tank maintenance hacks, man. What uh, what are some hacks? What are some uh, some tips for some people in terms of maintenance to make life easier? I still gravel vac a lot, so you know I love Python. They make great things. Yep. Uh, I'm. You know, I'm flying all around town. I'm sort of brutal on equipment. I got tired of stepping on Python gravel vacs. So I I had – there's other places to get it, but I had gone to usplastics.com, and, and there's a company called Harvell that makes clear PVC. And, uh, you, you know, when you're doing it for a living, I could look at the – you know, I got this length of – I think they're four-inch, four-inch clear PVC tubing, and I might have got like a three-foot section. A little pricey. Yeah. If you do this for a living, and if I spent, I don't remember how much it was anymore, but 80 bucks on this, it's a thing where I could step on it. I could run over it with my truck. And so I throw it in the back of my truck. So it's my gravel vac that I made, you know, and glue some couplings to a barb, you know, and then so stuff like that, making your own gravel vacs, um, <coughs> hacks, you know, different hoses, um, using trash cans, you know, just I think when you do it for a living, I have two two tenants. Do a great job and do that great job quickly. For me personally, doing a great job is the most important. Yeah. Doing it quickly is right behind there. So I use larger hoses. I you know, do stuff like this because <clears throat> I've got to do a great job and I've got to do it quickly and get out of there to the next place. Um, Big ES is uh, asking, have you guys seen the Rocky Mountain Fish Filter Company's Rapid Rinse Filter? And Than is saying the Rocky Mountain product is interesting, but I don't think they have a seven-inch model yet. Any Is that that thing? I'm not familiar with it. I think that's that thing that's all these little discs that you sort of tighten. And then just to clean it, you just undo the disc. Um, Am I correct? Yeah, I don't know if anybody knows. Put that uh, in the <coughs> chat. Hey, Remy, what's happening there? Bahama Lama Coral. Hey. Yep, reef therapy in the house. Yeah, there you go. Um, Remy's got the golden voice. He does. Well, he's a radio guy. There he is. The super chat. Remy, Remy and, thank you, man. Remy and, and Keith. I can't. I'm on Keith's show. Keith has the <laughs> sexiest voice ever. <laughs> no, I, I. Remy has got everybody beat. Snail for Peninsula. Snail for Peninsula. What does that mean, man, Remy? Not exactly. Is that code for something? Yeah, it was are, are the Russians attacking? <laughs> Snail for Peninsula, the eagle has been. Snail for the Peninsula. I'm gonna think about that. What what about uh, algae scrapers, After man? Magnets. What do you like? Magnets? Oh, cleaning. Yeah. Oh, hands down, tons of. Really? Hands they're, down. They're no freaking question. expensive, though, aren't they? Give a shit. I do this for a living. <laughs> what about the flipper, man? I like that flipper. You don't like it? I'm You're sorry. not a flipper man? I swore by flippers for a long time. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's not my thing. The Now, okay, so I love the Tunza one a lot. Now, there's a I – don't, I don't, I'm not going to call it Ben invented this, but <laughs> there's a thing I did early on where you – you know, you, they provide you with one long side and one blade. 
I order extra, so I take that other side and put another long side and another blade. And it just turns into an algae cleaning monster. Now, oh, and, and if Richard is watching, there's a company that started making ceramic blades. And they're a little expensive, but um, because I love the Tunza blades a lot, but let's be honest, after a little time, they start cutting grooves where you notice the algae doesn't get cut. I think it's, is it like four, four Q ventures or something? Uh -huh. For the name of it they they 3d print a mount and then they sell a ceramic blade and it's like 35 bucks so you'd spend like 70 dollars having two sides but it doesn't warp well that's not good dude it's got to work yeah so so that's why i think my, my my ultimate favorite is the tons of care magnet with the this company that 3d prints and please someone if they know what i'm talking about please say what it is they make a 3D mounted thing just for the tons that goes on there, and then this white ceramic blade goes on there. And it, man, it'll mow through coralline. Todd, Todd it'll... says 4D. 4D aquatics. <coughs> okay. Okay. Um, See, it's not about me. It's about the people, my friends. <laughs> it's not. It's not what you know. It's who you know. Um, yeah, Than saying every time I think to buy a tons of algae scraper, it's sold out everywhere, and I forget to look for the rest of the year. <laughs> No, the, but unless you're talking about a giant aquarium and then you're talking about those, what are those? Yeah. Mighty. Yeah. Um, it, it, as long as you're within the purvey of uh, something that a tons of could handle, there, there's no, the, the second place to me on an algae cleaning magnet is a far drop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it definitely makes a difference because that coralline can just really build up over time. And I always find like, <clears throat> if you can, you know, get that quality, uh, scraper or whatnot and just stay on top of it, then that just makes life a lot easier. Um, I'll tell you something. If you leave the magnets in the tank, first of all, consider not doing that. Second of all, realize that when you turn the internal part over, there's a white pin, a band across the magnet, a band across the magnet and a white pin on that internal part. Yeah. And you have to be cognizant if you leave it in there that like, you know, foraminiferans and, you know, vermeted snails, stuff like this can grow on there. And even on glass, because I've done it, you can, you know, do little s scrapes right. on glass. So, you know, if you're leaving it in the tank, I would look now and then you could clean it with citric or muriatic, but just be sure that the pin, the band, the band and the pin don't because those are like the major contact points right and so just keep those clean or keep the magnet off the glass What about glass cleaners you know in terms of keeping the outside of the uh or acrylic uh cleaners what do you uh what do you like i hate acrylic aquariums mm, me too i don't i don't uh, use I them i think i have two acrylic aquariums and a as a maintenance provider you would hate them even more because you know i'm showing up i'm trying to clean the tank i'm trying to get out of there i scratch yeah. it i Look at it crooked. It's a scratch, and then it's my fault. I got a blah blah blah. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. But, but uh, um, um, I don't find it too necessary to like go buy products to clean the outside. However, and I'm not trying to endorse them or anything, but the, Tunza makes this thing that has like surfactants in it. I think it has like clove oil. It's kind of cool. It smells like cinnamon or something, but it's sort of a nice touch. Yeah. I don't always remember to carry it into the house when I clean a tank, but sometimes I put it in a backpack that I carry with me. Sometimes I remember to squirt it on there, and it it does. You know when you when you spill too much salt in the the glass gets a little sort of greasy yeah, and salty. Yeah, like this really cuts through that. Got a couple of folks, uh, Sturgis Reef and Reef Keeper, saying I like the Fritz glass cleaner with the microfiber. Yeah, never yeah. never tried that, but um, yeah. Um, what else, dude? In terms of maintenance tips for folks, what um, you know, what 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 are um, what are like some pet peeves that you have that uh, in terms of what you think people are not doing enough of that you know are not your clients and people that you just kind of uh, you know friends of yours, reef keepers that you know out there that um, you know are, are maintaining reef tanks. What what is kind of like stuff that perhaps is being neglected more so than it should be? People are doing too much. Adding too much stuff to their tanks, too trying different methods. Now I don't blame them because, I mean, I'm 30 years in. When you're three years in, four years in, five years in, whatever, 
you're trying stuff, you know, you're doing this. You, man, we all, anyone watching this, I think is, is, is past the fold or however you want to say it. If you're watching Reef Bum or any of these things, you're, you're trying to educate yourself. So I already sort of consider you're past the type of people that, that used to walk into fish stores back in the day. If you're trying to further educate yourself, you're already sort of in the know a little bit, but it's all about stability. And we know that. And with reef aquariums, even like, let's say I find out I have high nitrates. Okay. Well, I want to come back down. Go slow. Go slow. I have high phosphates. Go slow. Okay. My alkalinity has been bad for a while. Go slow. Nearly anything except for dumping a jar of caulkwasser into your <laughs> tank or something like that. Go slow. Uh, if you dump a container of caulkwasser in your tank, don't go slow because that's like slowly walking out of a burning building. Get the hell out. Of it, you know, but go go slow. So, you know, if you're like, oh, I want to try an ATS. Go slow. Oh, I want to try GFO. Go slow. What what is it? What does it say on the side of the bottle? How much to use GFO? Do a quarter of that. Yeah. Work to that. I don't even care what the directions say on that. Do less than yeah. that. Sneak up to it. Lanthanum chloride. Sneak up to it. Anything. Sneak up to it. I'm going to start adding traces. Sneak up to it. I haven't been doing water change as much. I'm going to start doing it. Sneak up to it. Go slow. Don't do too damn much. So you're a tank maintenance guy, and when there's an issue with the tank, let's say cyano, bryopsis, what have you, um, and I get it if, if, you know, I think I know what your answer is because I think we talked about this the last time you were on a couple of years ago, but, um, hit it with chemicals because it's a quick fix or have your, I, has your attitude kind of changed on that? If, if there's other maintenance techs watching this, you know, they'll, they'll laugh in agreement with this. It's like, there's things I would do as a hobbyist that I don't have the luxury of when I'm doing it for someone. If I get cyano, I love blue life. The, the Blue Life one. I also like Boyd Enterprises one. Um, I don't have much of a choice. Yeah. Now, I'm awful good at it, too. You know, because I, I see people get scared, like, I don't want to use that, and I'm not sure. And yes, it makes the skimmer go crazy, and there's a whole methodology you do afterwards to move to the next page. Um, I don't care whether you have a $1,000 aquarium or a $1 million aquarium. You will get cyano. Then you can say, why did I get cyano? Uh, good luck finding that out. That's useless to figure out as well. If you habitually get it, something's probably going on. Your skimmer sucks. Your methodology sucks. Yeah. But if you are if you have a nice reef tank and uh, once or twice a year you get cyano, hey, join the crowd. Yeah. Happens. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I hit it with, with those. Sometimes uh, Richard likes to do this like three-day, five-day blackout. I've had that happen before. When I'm doing this for someone and they would say, what's all this red grossness, you know, you gross stuff in out. the Bro, I got to get it out because I don't want to piss them off. And, yeah. You know, but yeah, there is a whole thing that I do that involves wet skimming and more polyfilter and carbon and and paying extra, you know, for extra maintenance that I have to do on the back end to get to get the tank back to square one. But I mean, after messing with that sort of, you know, you, there could be, you know, early people that haven't been doing this long and like, oh, I'm sort of scared to add, you know, red slime remover. It's like, dude, trust me, I've been doing this. 30 years messing with it and I have a whole method to doing it and you blast cyano out of the atmosphere and move on in a couple days. Yeah. Yeah. Dinos are not the same story. That's yeah. That'll make you, what do you, what do you do with dinos, man? What's your, uh, what's your thing there with uh, dinos? That's, that's a whole figure out whatever God or whatever you pray to and, uh, <laughs> burn some candles. No, I know that there, I'm, I'm not going to claim to be an expert, but I know there's like two type of dinoflagellates. One responds well to like UV sterilization. The other one responds well to crying and praying. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get that second one. I, I, I've been there, done that before. And uh, <laughs> I know this sounds bad, but sometimes, you know, I've gotten dinos bad in the customer tank. Well, you know, sometimes these are the customers that don't even know what the hell they're looking at. And they don't know that they have dinos. <laughs> and, and I'll spend like, four months trying to maintenance the hell out of the out of the pit before they say what's all this snotty <laughs> crap you know but and, and i have I, I i don't know what i've done but i have sometimes just maintenance the hell out of it after months and me going like god i hope they don't say anything and then it just craters oh then it just disappears if it was a hobby if i was a hobbyist and had that at home you know i'd maybe try some more 
So, but, but then again, I could mess with my tank every single day. Jason yeah. Langer says, Rich needs to drink less if he's having 3D blackouts. Go slow. <laughs> yeah. Go slow. Go slow. Rich. Go slow. Hey, at least he's not having the five-day or seven-day blackouts. If, if you have a week, if you if you just starting starting to see some cyano, I promise you, you can have no lights for three days. And, and it's almost, don't worry about your corals. They will be fine. Now, okay, I guess caveat. If you kill a coral doing this, ain't my fault. <laughs> but but I've, I've done it so many times, the three-day blackout, and sometimes you can just beat back the cyano like that. Yeah, sometimes, you, you know, I mean, if you know what the source is of the cyano, if you kind of like have that figured out in terms of what is driving the cyano, the growth, then, um, yeah, I think a, a three- or five-day blackout, whatever, I guess three days is a lot safer than a five-day or, or a four-day. Well, why five? You know, it's pretty random. But, um it's just something to kind of uh, interrupt the uh, the whole life cycle there, I guess, and reset it. And if you know what the source is, then you could potentially uh, beat it back that way by by not um, you know continuing on with whatever is driving fueling that cyano. I'm not a microbiologist, but I play one on TV. No, I just kidding. Um, um, but I don't believe I'm wrong in saying that like like uh, cyanobacteria and blue green algaes were like some of the first things on this planet. So when we're when we get upset and like, how did cyano show up? I mean, cyano has so many pathways that it can choose to show up that it, it doesn't matter if you find out how it got there because it has so many different ways that it can. So it, it's evolved so long to get what it needs. I think, you know, you just got to see it when it's cropping up and try to hit it hard. Because normally, you know, if I'm seeing a tank every other week and a cyano problem crops up pretty heavy by the time I see it, I just got to nuke it from space and move on. Fan says, I, if I leave a pile of detritus, it will eventually grow red slime. That, that's, that's true. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what's going to happen, you know, and, and that's why it's so important to kind of uh, try to, you know, use that, uh, that poly filter and, and blow detritus off of the rocks. And I, I, every other day, I siphon detritus out of all my tanks, you know um just to, to to stay on top of that because yeah it will uh it will happen yeah and didn't you know isn't everyone watching this isn't that where we start usually seeing cyano you see it in some like back corner you know where it's a little slow i don't know if that's what it takes for it to crop up because sometimes i've seen it on high flow areas but it's always some forgotten corner with some rubble and it just starts poking up and i fully believe cyanobacteria is one of those things where once it's multiplied it's Sort of begins multiplying exponentially and that's it's just throwing spores or whatever you want to call it everywhere it just goes from nothing to your house is on fire and you know. ali adapora ben is the man what's happening there ali i, I am a man i'm not the <laughs> man one last topic i wanted to <clears throat> cover with you there ben Re i'm good for as long as you All want right. me um well yeah folks keep dropping questions in the chat there then we would keep dropping super chats and we'll be here. <laughs> yeah. For seriously. Um, Off up that dope. Exactly. Redundancy. What, um, what should people be, uh, you know, thinking about in terms Wait. of redundancy in terms of equipment? I love two main pumps, not one. Me too. Love two main pumps all day long. I love taking whatever uh, heater wattage you think you need. Cut that in two. Yeah. Put two of them in. Yeah. One heat shits the bed. Sorry, can I talk yeah, like that here? you can cuss. It's too <laughs> late now. You know, take, uh, take, you know, and even like, I like spreading heaters out too. Like, you know, get them far away from each other, whatnot. But, uh, you know, whatever, you know, th th there becomes a point where it's like, you know, do you need two skimmers? No, you don't need two of everything unless you just want two tanks. But It's uh, good to have like a spare skimmer, you know, if in case your skimmer pump craps out. Right? Or have a spare light fixture. Yeah. That's... Oh, yeah, because we can all afford two Mitras. <laughs> yeah, you got an Abyss? Just get four Abyss. You know what I'm talking about, dude. Just have something on the side. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, main pumps and heaters, those are two things. And then maybe for your circulation pumps, it's not a horrible idea to, at some point, buy some spare parts. You got Vortex, get a spare wet side you got uh you know your your skimmer pump uh contact the company or whatever try to get a spare impeller because i promise you after a few years a needle wheel impe impeller will burn out yeah. be proactive there th here's a little a little piece of advice that i do 
<clears throat> like, uh, okay, um, I like dosing a lot. So when I have a doser, even if I buy a brand new doser, let's say it's a dose, I've bought that that another cap. Yep. Or it's, let's say it's a Kameer or however the hell you call that. Kameer, Kameer. Tubing set right away. If you buy a doser right away, buy an extra tubing set. What I do is put it in a little Ziploc baggie, take a thumbtack, and pin it right by that piece of equipment. Don't throw it in a drawer. Don't put it here. Like, oh, yeah, I ordered a second dosing set. No, pin it in a plastic baggie right by the piece of equipment. The tubing set springs a leak or gets messed up. Oh, now, where did I put that tubing set? It's right there. It's right next to the thing. Yeah, I mean, I so, like to have um, like an extra pH probe because I, you know, I have I have them in my uh, calcium reactors. So, you know, those things can like, go haywire. If you have a calcium reactor and you and you obviously have a pH probe in it, I promise you, buy a brand new pH probe. Make sure it's, you know, they had to be stored yep. wet. I can't remember what the yeah. solution is, but you can even buy more of that solution. I don't I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here, but I think it's potassium something maybe. Okay. But uh, uh, buy it buy a second one, make sure it's stored upright or whatever so it stays in the liquid cuz you will need one. And and think of that situation where the pH probe craps the bed and then you're and hey, let's be honest here. Haven't I been seeing that like uh, Neptune's been having a hard time getting hold of double junction pH probes? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And, the, and, and then you need one. And then what now? All of a sudden you have to. Like, what do I do now? And I, I've got to start dosing this because, you know, have it w with a crucial piece of equipment. Consider buying a second one and setting it to the side because and what's that saying? You'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have yeah. it yeah could wreck your system not having it no there's a lot of things that could happen that uh if you're kind of like uh you know uh, caught with your pants down so to speak and you need to rely on uh you know getting something via the mail <clears throat> and and you don't want to pay like a hundred dollars to have something overnighted to you then you know you could be looking at two three four or five days or something like that before you could potentially get that unless you're near a uh you know in a major city hub or whatnot uh, if you got, uh, you know, a local fish store that's got a lot of the, uh, the supplies that you may potentially need at your disposal, then that's one thing. But I live in the boonies, so, uh, and, and I rely on, on the, uh, the mail. And, oh, yeah. you know, so that's, uh, that's one thing. You got to definitely be thinking about that. But I would definitely say have, have um, return pump is key. I, I do have um, two return pumps going. So I don't have, like, a spare return pump. I've actually got two return pumps going. And I've had like one of those return pumps, like shit the bed on me and I've been limping around with one uh, return pump. But if I didn't have that other return pump, then, you know, what the hell? That, that's great because one of my, my other, I don't think it's controversial, but one of my other opinions that other people share is like, I think I touched on it earlier, but this obsession that we had a crazy turnover rate between the yeah. sump and the main tank, like, that's not necessary. So, you know, honestly, even if you had two, pumps and one of them dies for a bit a little bit like that turnover is still fine you know yeah it's 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 fine as long as you have great internal circulation it's fine if you're only passing through like one volume an hour you know and then and then you're not like oh overnight that pump i need it now just hey just send it whenever get it boom put it back on there cool. yeah now money well spent i think it's money well spent you know in terms of like having some spare stuff parts equipment um off on the side um <clears throat> another uh another uh, series of questions for you man <clears throat> pests like aptasia planaria flatworms vermitid snails what are your uh what are your remedies there um i hate red flatworms they're <clears throat> so frustrating the reason for that you know the funny thing on cyanobacteria and i'm very comfortable with red slime remover I've been using it for decades, but I like the Salifert flatworm, flatworm X. Like it's not cut and dry. It can bomb I've your tank that. out. Now I'm not saying the liquid does, but that's the problem with red planaria is you you know you because the even on the instructions they say remove as much as you can physically yeah, it's see. Yeah, not gonna happen. You're taking a couple days to do yeah. it, bring the population down, and invariably they're hiding somewhere you didn't see. Yeah. So it's the crud that comes out of them. But they're toxic. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the toxin is. I don't know what the, you know, the deadly level is. But man, I've killed fish doing that. It sucks. Yeah. yeah. 
and that that's a that's you know that's a good thing for buying some sort of coral dip um you know and doing some sort of something are you, you know? doing that when you're bringing in corals to a client's tank are you pretty much dipping everything before they go into the tanks just so you don't bring that I stuff try, in I, don't want, I try to i don't want to bullshit you yeah. i end up doing it sometimes I'll, I'll at least when i'm picking the frag up i'll swish it before i put in there you know sometimes i'll like ben now now <laughs> you know and then i'll it depends if i have stuff handy like polyp lab makes this good little packet of uh i'm a i'm a bad bad boy because i can't remember the name of it but polyp lab has some decent stuff i can just carry little packets around and and do yeah. it but hey what, what is that the the ounce of prevention is a uh, pound of cure yeah yeah I could get lazy and then one day and like, dude, see flatworms and yeah, you know, like biological controls. That shit don't work. You know, they say like uh, Springer eye damsels and stuff like that. I love Springer eye damsels because they're not mean. But you know, the big thing used to be they eat red worms, brother. I have right now five Springer eye damsels in a two hundred that has had flatworms for a year that I just don't. I don't want to use flatworm exit. And are they? Just, um, are all the flatworms like on the glass, on the sand, or are they just on the corals? They're on everything, right? Sand and around corals yeah. and stuff. There, there's flatworms that I hate even more that I need know how to do even less to. Like I had this one tank for a while that they had these more beige, larger ones that would sit on euphilia, and then you get this conundrum because then the euphilia started dying, and I was like, is it the flatworms or is that coincidental? Are they because I know that there's like a flatworm that likes to eat euphilia yeah. or because there used to be this there's whole thing. There's so people much would... crap out there, dude, that is preying on our corals. And uh, I was talking about this with, um, oh, was it uh, was it last week with, um, who the hell was I talking about it with? And, and by a microscope, uh, Rich, your co-host yeah. was like, you won't believe what you're going to see under a microscope in terms of like the uh, all the stuff that's crawling around in your reef tank. I mean, it's just so many things. Man, I, I recently had a mishap in a client's tank with velvet. Ooh. And and so it caused me to sort of, you know, I, I would I'll, I'll freely tell you what one of my weak spots has been like medication and disease. Just because from my standpoint, like there's not much I can do for you at a client. And so it, it gets just real nasty. Obviously, if you have a tank at home, you can intensively do that. But if I came over to your house intensively, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So it's almost like the alternative is just let's see how it shakes out. But it made me bone up a little bit more. And, you know, I was watching a bunch of other podcasts. And there's that, there's that young dude, Salem. And so I was uh, watching his stuff about bacterias and man i swear the more you dig into like fish diseases and coral bacteria it's like it makes you just want to quit i know <laughs> there a better hobby out there <laughs> Isn't there a better just way throwing to the towel like, no to realize that like you know ameludinium can cyst up and and be on a damn snail and you're asking me do i quarantine my snails i just don't yeah. man and then did, did the did the disease come from a dang snail or a it's like, oh, I'm not a vet clinic, man. There's only so much I can do. And, you know, you would say, well, you're a professional, but it's like, it's, there, it's, there, it's there's, there's a, so to be followed by money. And it's like, what am I going to sell you a snail for $50? Yeah. No, I know. We take chances. We gamble. Yeah. yeah. I, I had, uh, I, I had some fish got wiped out by, I believe, disease brought in by snails. So I, you know, I didn't realize that was a possibility, but you live and learn. Um, oh, that thing from salem i was listening to was uranema and that oh i don't ever want to yeah that sounded like a thing if it gets in your tank it's it's Never like gonna get to get it out like there's some it just doesn't go away um andrew bauma says uh kcl ben um Ooh. and and that's um i've had success with flatworms uh the uh planaria and no, actually it was uh aceola flatworms that were on my uh ghanis and alveopora they, they weren't mm -hmm. on anything else. <clears throat> and so I just dipped those uh, colonies in potassium yeah. chloride. Gone. I mean, I, I tried yeah. other dips to um, like the uh, Coral RX, I think, was one I was using. And, and um, the flatworms were just kind of like receding to the skeleton with that dip. Yeah. And so it wouldn't kill them all. all. You know, so the ones that receded into the uh, skeleton, eventually, like a few weeks later, a couple of months later, they would just grow back to what, what they were uh, the, the, those uh, same, you know, proportions. But when I dipped into the KCL, gone. 
done. Yeah. It annihilated them, which was uh even if you have to do it a couple times as long as that, you know, that coral's accessible. Yeah, like you, right. I, I have a client that has a real pretty tridacna. Um it's a squamosa, but it's a really weird pattern. And um and this is a very old school thing, but I found that it had little pyramid snails underneath the mm. like the bisel oak in the bottom. And uh so I've freshwater dipped it a couple times or toothbrushed it or whatever and i just found like every every couple months it'll start shrinking up a little bit and i turn it over and it's like i'd like to get rid of the per pyramid snails but at the same time i'd brush them off and man it goes it's it's does super healthy for a long yeah. time eventually i'll try to get ahead of the pyramid snails i know you can do that with some types of wrasses yeah. but it's like that that sort of you know the dishes are never done you have yeah. to stay on top of yeah, it yeah it's a pain in the ass Than is saying, sometimes killing off annoying <clears throat> microfauna opens the door to really uncommon bugs taking hold and really causing problems. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like this, um, you know, domino effect. The the reef tank is a That's very delicate ecosystem, right? And you knock out something, then it's going to open the door for something else. That's why. That's one of the things. The hobby, you asked me this sort of a question <laughs> like this earlier, but the the some hobbyists have been doing stuff that I personally am super uncomfortable with. That's all the Cipro stuff and all this yeah. antibiotic stuff, man. I don't touch that with a 10 foot pole. I don't want to be responsible for flesh eating. <laughs> well, you're, using, you're using chemically, dude. I mean, you're nuking tanks with chemically and that's antibiotics. Right. You know, so, thank you for the guilt trip, Keith. <laughs> Is that what I came in here for? <laughs> to, 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 you just, just show a mirror. Go for it. Face just go for it, man. Body. <laughs> yeah, I want to be a simple bro. You're bombing the tanks anyway, so what the hell? <laughs> yeah, just throwing penicillin down the sink. That's <laughs> recycling. Why don't you work anymore? Um, what about uh, vermitid snails, man? Everybody's always talking about vermitid snails and bumblebee. You know. So Richard, I believe, has <laughs> nightmares about vermitid snails. Vermitid, vermitid, potato, potato, but. <laughs> I know that the bigger ones are more problematic. I have some tanks with those little tiny ones in there. Um, and sometimes that can be infuriating because they can go like millions of them. And it's like, do I mess with them? You know, honestly, I don't mess with them too much because it seems like maybe it's the bigger ones that are more of a problem. Yeah. And it seems like they're more of a problem to SPS. So I do a lot of mixed reefs. And I, I have some reefs with a lot of SPS in them. But I, I don't vermetids don't cause me much pain um i'm going i'm jumping back and forth here but <clears throat> that's how my brain works Briopsis. um hey i don't want to brag and wear some wood here <laughs> knock on wood i see it's funny i don't have to deal with hair algae very often but at the same time i can't really tell you what i'm doing it's just good maintenance but uh the old school thing of like tanks filled with hair algae I, i have not had that sort of issue in a long time so maybe i would like to think it's just great consistent maintenance yeah i you so, know i find like if you see it then pluck it stick some yeah. putty on top of it turn the rock over if you can <clears throat> you know the manual removal is a big key to that thing oh, richard and i've talked about before like you're sitting in your living room and there's a candle underneath a drape in the room you're like you're just sitting there with your buddy and you're like hey look there's a fire <laughs> yeah that's crazy and the drapes on fire and the couch is on fire hey man do you think we should do something about <laughs> well, hell yeah so you see some bryopsis coming up pinch it cover yeah. it get rid yeah, of it don't, don't watch it grow <laughs> yeah Oh, hey, bro, look at that fire. Yeah, that's great, it, it'll just keep popping up in places here and there, and it's a pain in the ass. But, yeah, you you start, like, sitting back and relaxing and not <clears throat> not doing something. Then you got but, a but real Keith, problem. But, Keith, here's the unfair thing. Let's say you and I get a bryopsis problem. You know, we sort of know what to do, or we have the people we can contact to do that. I think not seeing the, the, the force for the trees And that maybe even some viewers watching this, what do you get a, a one year, two year, three year hobbyist? And they're like, man, I didn't even know what to yeah. do. So that, yeah. that's tough. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. us as, I guess, if we want to call ourselves as advanced reefers, you know, we're like, oh, it's easy. Just do this or that. And it's no big deal. But I, I, I feel the pain of a, of a early 
early experience reefer like that's great but i don't even know what to do sometimes i didn't even know what those red things were and now they're everywhere <laughs> i thought that little pokey eptasia was cool and i let it grow and now i find out it's bad that's or... another thing man it's like you know that the whole lazy reef keeper kind of takes hold it's like all right there's an eptasia in my tank uh, i guess maybe uh, tomorrow i'll deal with it <clears throat> Then tomorrow yeah. comes, and you're looking at it, and you're like, you know, I'll, I'll definitely deal with that Aptasia. And then, yeah, Keith, and, Keith, you're that guy on the couch with a beer, like, damn, my drapes are on fire. Yeah, yeah, I'll get yeah. up. You know, and and uh, you're you're completely right. You know, you got to like be uh, proactive and not inactive on that sort of thing, or else it's just like be crazy. But Aptasia yeah. wise, I always find that peppermint shrimp do the job. So, oh, not now? me. I mean, there's Aptasia, then there's Bergia, then there's F Aptasia, you know, added on there. There's covering it up with epoxy or super glue. There's Aptasia eating file fish. There's, I agree with Richard in that, you know, a lot of times you'll go on forums and people are always shouting for, you know, bio controls. Oh, this fish eats it. This sh shrimp eats it. This, uh, man, bio control is sometimes very lame. Um, Sure, certainly over the years I've thrown a bunch of, peppermint shrimp in a tank and they've dominated some aptasia but there's also i would also say how many times i've done that which is dozens upon dozens if not past a hundred times i'd say a lot of those times they didn't do shit at all um salt water and lime brings up something i was going to ask you about in terms of coral snow treatments for treating vermitids it um that didn't work for me i've done some coral snow um treatments for for an extended period of time i experimented with that have uh, have you done coral snow treatments for vermitid to help with water clarity? Is that something you've messed around with, man? So I, um, like I said, most of my clients are very hands off. Um, I do have a couple hands on clients. One of them is a very, I would consider him an advanced reefer, but he makes so much money doing a thing that he just he brings me in, and I've actually learned a lot from him. That's cool. I've learned a lot from him. He's learned a lot from me. He's an accomplished reefer. He just doesn't have the time. But he had some, he has a SPS dominated tank and he had some cyano creeping yeah. up. And, uh, you know, I can't, which, you know, hey, I'll, I'll freely admit, I can't know everything. You know, yes, I have a lot of experience. I just don't know everything. Yeah. Uh, he told me one day he was like doing this thing with calcium, whatever, snow and Microbacter 7. Yeah. And he was freaking out. He said, it blew my cyano out of the water. And I was like, what? Yeah. And, you know, some I came to his house and look and it did. Now, it wasn't as like final as ChemiClean. Right. But uh, did a couple treatments. It went away and I was like, you know, old dog, new tricks. I was like, man, I don't know exactly what it's doing. I don't know if it has to be Microbacter 7. I don't know how important the flocculin or whatever the calcium yeah. is. But it did it did something and we didn't do anything else besides that. So, yeah. you know, there's these things that don't have too much data or substantiation behind it. Um, and as long as they don't sound too hokey, I'm just like, yeah. well, you know, a bunch of people corroborate and duplicate that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I tried that for cyano specifically and it didn't really work for me, but you know, I mean, listen, I've, I've heard the anecdotal evidence myself in terms of people doing that and working for them. It's just, it's one of those things like every reef tank is there. There's just so many different variables that are in play that, um, you know, I think it's hard to kind of say like, some some sort of experimental treatment might be kind of like a catch-all uh thing that you can do for every reef tank it's uh it's tough i think um we just you know we don't know a lot about what's going on in our reef tanks we know a lot more than we used to in years past because we got a lot more information we've got the icp testing which is um you know a lot of people are doing we've got the microbiomics testing so there's a lot more data that we have but i still feel like there's just so much we don't know and, you know, old old bullshit crops up. I I had someone not too long ago ask me about ginger for curing ick. Oh, really? And I was like, dude, that was a parody. As a matter of fact, I think Richard made that up in an article a long time ago. <laughs> it was one of those things where he made it up as a joke and then people ran with it. And it was like it turned into its own thing. Really? Wow. There you go. That's that's the lore. The lore. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, dude. Um, I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap it up. Anything else you uh, wanted to say there, uh, Ben? Or what's that? Is that because of you, or you're you're concerned about my time? Um. Well, you want to keep hanging out? 
Yes. All right. What else you want to talk about, Let's man? Give what they want. <laughs> We're gonna keep going. Yeah, they, they, it's all on you. When you, I'll, 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 I'll out party you, man. Let's do it. <laughs> Keith, Keith, well, Keith. Then I think Keith. I need another beer. Yeah, unfortunately, I just have sparkling water. <laughs> it might not as exciting. <laughs> like party, and I'm drinking seltzer water. Big time. People, drop some more uh, questions, comments in the uh, in the chat. We'll uh, we'll keep it going. We'll keep this party going. I'll, I'll tell you one interesting thing about cleaning tanks that you know I would I would if anyone out there also does what I do, and they would understand this. It's like it's so funny because uh, you know at some point you're like, wow, I can really keep a reef tank pretty well i'm gonna go do this for a living it doesn't mean squat like you have to be good with people and that man that's a whew, that's a rough road depending on your type of personality i mean because you go out there it's like retail sales though sort of because you're just exposed to all these different type of personalities and type of people and I, I also, you know, there, there, in, in Reef Beef, we, we have these calls. Some people can pay us to get like, you know, just to get other information or get coached or whatever. And I have these a uh, couple of people that, that have a maintenance company like way away from me. I'm not going to help anyone in my sphere of influence, but, you know, far away. And one thing I was sort of telling him was, I know it sounds crazy, but if you do this for a living after you've been doing it for a while, you don't let people take advantage of you because sometimes I hate to say, but it's true. Sometimes these wealthy people or whatever clientele will try to take advantage of you, ask you to drop off food for free or, or do some extra work for free or all this stuff. So you have to, you have to have sufficient uh, respect with yourself to not let anybody use you like that. And, and all the while talking to people professionally and uh, you know, you get all sorts of, Crazy people, as clientele, man. It's you have to be very versatile in how you deal with people. I bet you could spend another three hours, dude, talking about some of these uh, war stories with clients. Oh God, yeah. Um, Todd, yep. Champion Lighting Supply. Thank you much, man, for that super chat. More Ben yep. is the uh, is the comment. <laughs> Telegram. Arm hair removes nitrates. Just saying. <laughs> it does. If you put if you put a caulk paste on your arm hair. And you dip it, and there's just the phosphate is attracted, and you just pull it out, and then shave your arm. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. That's a myth. Come on. This is you know, we it's wouldn't okay. want to do. We don't want to disseminate misinformation on this show. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Old news. Fake news. Title Fake Stan. News. I'm looking forward to hanging out in Colorado. Yeah. Oh hell yeah. Yeah. Um, Ryan Washington. Thoughts on feeding corals. Um, um, from, from a hobbyist standpoint or from my standpoint, uh, let's, let's do yours and then, sw you know, kind of like try to tie it into a hobbyist. <clears throat> I, I don't get, I, I don't get too crazy with it. There's this thing that I do uh, frequently, but I don't do it every single time. I I'll take a polyp lab. You could do it with Bene, Bene pets too, but polyp lab, the refroids. So I'll, I'll take a can with me or I'll leave one at a client's. So before I do anything, I pull up to a client, I'll take a fat pinch and I'll put it right by the intake of the main pump. I'll, I'll flood the system and then I'll start, you know, make sure the water's ready, make sure you gather my stuff, get my this, you know, and then I clean the tank. So it's, you know, in my head, it's like heavy in, heavy out. But see, that's the trick if you want to get scientific about it is that not every coral eats the same thing, nor does every coral eat in the same manner. Mm. So... I fully know well that if I'm doing that, it's not doing shit for some of the corals. But at the least, you know, I do the heavy in and then I either, you know, I either do a regular water change or wet skimming to try to remove then some of that. Um, there are some corals that like I always have problems with micro mooses. Mm. They don't they they're I love them because they're so gorgeous. Yeah. And it, we're not we're all not all good at everything there'll probably be someone in there that does aquarium maintenance in the chat and say like i do great with them that's cool <laughs> but, uh, are you doing that um, yeah i'm a wizard how many times i gotta tell you you forgetful no but uh you, you're doing it like you're not even like uh looking at you know you're it's like seamless yeah <laughs> you got so your, you got your magic. finger on the button or something like that is that what you're doing i just it's certain like glyphs and hand waves you know <laughs> You know, I don't. That's the only two I know uh, so far. Magic the there is over your. Uh... Yeah. I tried the double finger, but that is very <laughs> you, disappointed. You, you in got the fire. Software. You didn't get the fireworks with the double finger, though. 
You got to do some yeah. other kind of like visual. They know the difference between a middle finger and a thumb. That's <laughs> um, but but so I was I was you know I was sad because like I want to keep micro moose in some people's tanks and I was sort of you know throwing it out there to some people and they're like well feed it and I was like well I'm only at these situations once a week or every other week and they assured me so I started doing it now I don't have anything to report back to you but I think if I fed a micro moose once or or twice. Like uh, twice or four times a month, like that could be it. But you know, there in that, look into it because some people just think like, oh, corals, you have to feed corals, and like, oh, they all corals eat this substance, and it's it's just simply not true. You know, some things might eat reefroids. Some things, it might look like they're eating it, but if you were more scientific about it and looked like close up, what you're seeing that polyp, you know. In in tract or whatever, it's just because the thing bumped into it and pissed it off. It's not because it ate yeah. it. You know what to say? Would you slice it open and check the gut contents? Like, let's be scientific about. I've this. never really been re very regimented in terms of coral feeding. You know, I've um, I pretty much lean on a do-it-yourself coral fish food. So I'll I'll um, you know, I've got this um, meat grinder. I'll put in some salmon, some you know, yeah, right. <laughs> And and some uh, you know like codfish or whatever scallops, some shrimp, and then throw in some um, you know uh, like the silver sides, ginger. ginger. There you go. Reefroids. I put in some reefroids. Whatever you know, and I just mix it. Uh, you know, just uh, do it in a little. Uh, you know, turn it into a, like a little paste. Freeze it. I got yeah. my own cubes or whatnot, and and just feed it to the tank. I, I you know I don't know exactly what it's uh, doing to the uh, to the corals or what have you, but the fish are digging it. So I sort of feel like the more aggressive looking certain corals are, you know, do you have to go get crazy with feeding a coral? Certainly you don't. Sometimes it can bring out the growth a little faster in, in LPS. Sometimes the coloration a little better. Things like a, a cyanarena. I, I know. I'm sorry. I don't know what they call that. Meat, meat coral, tooth coral, cyanarena lacrimalis. Like any of those ones that have it folded up, the little stubby tentacles, trachophilia, open green brain. Yeah. Cyanarena, um, lobophilias do this a little bit, symphilia, favia a little bit, uh, ulophilia, all these things that can sometimes at night have all these nice little stinger tentacles. If they have little nice stingy tentacles, give them some food a couple times a month. Yeah, and, and I should say I'm, I'm, I'm talking strictly about my, myself or SPS. You know, I'm not an LPS kind of uh, person, so that's a, um, that's a whole different ball game, you know. I know that um, folks really do um, feel like it does make a difference, and I'm sure it does. I, I... you know, but you got to think there's also amino acids. You can do that liquid. Like, does that replace food? I don't know. Is it still nutrition they absorb through their skin barrier? Yeah. You know, I'm an aquarium maintenance guy. I am not a marine biologist. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a microbiologist. I just, uh, I just have beautiful hair. Is all. <laughs> um, it it's gotten long, dude. What yeah. my hair? Yeah, yeah, it's getting there. You know, I started this when COVID started because in the beginning I was like, I don't want to be by anybody. <laughs> and then it started growing out and I have a nasty widow's peak. Uh -huh. And so, you know, hey, and I'm 48. I'm just saying like this is kind of like your you midlife it, crisis, dude. Sort of. I want to look <laughs> want to look like how Julian looked like when I first. Uh -huh. <laughs> getting close. Uh -huh. Atkins Nature Aquariums. What is Ben's least favorite fish for a client that the client always asks for? Asks for. Now, this is not that a client always asks for it, but it is simultaneously one of my favorite ocean fish and my least favorite aquarium fish is a powder blue tank. I love powder blue tanks, but I can't keep them. They're so they're they're freaking nuts. They're crazy. Clown, clown tangs, so hall tangs. Yeah. Just wicked evil powder brown tangs. Yeah. Uh, that paraacanthurus and uh, I, th I think clown is paraacanthurus as well, but uh, they're just nasty evil. Um, yeah, and like I said, most of my clients, they, I, I love it, but they're just literally like make it look pretty, they, <laughs> and they don't even know what things are called, but they may look online like, hey, can you get one of these red things? Yeah, that's a flame hawk. Yeah, we can put those in there. And, you know, but yeah, sometimes they, you know, and they're like, can we get this powder blue? Th oh, hell no. <laughs> Do you like your other fish? They're the biggest assholes in the, uh, you know, that you could put in it. And also one of the most gorgeous they are. fish. They are. That I 
they, you know, the last one I had was like a model citizen for a couple of years. It was the last tang, you know, that I added to my peninsula tank. I had other tangs in there. And then one day, like the light switches flip and this dude like went nuclear on everybody. Keith, you know what drives me nuts? What, Ben? What drives you nuts? <laughs> you, you sort of touched on it right there. Since I do this for a living, and for the first 10 years, I, I worked at five different pet stores. I was either the guy behind the counter or I'm now the guy driving to your house. So when we're talking about what you want to put into aquarium, what sort of drives me nuts is people say, I wanted this. And I say, well, statistically, that's not very easy to do or it's going to do this and this. And people just say, I want to do it. You know, I want five dwarf angels in my tank. Mm. I want. 30 tangs in my tank. I want this impossible to keep fish. I want stuff like this. It's frustrating, man, because that's sort of on me. Unless, and my one client that's watching this, he's, he's probably giggling because that's some of what he does. But we have an agreement between each other since he's so hands-on. He, he still tells me what he wants, and, and we do it. Just You can't call me at midnight and say, it's not working. <laughs> it's like, you made this choice, okay? <laughs> But, uh, but but what I don't like is someone says I have a powder blue and it is being fine, cool, bro. Yeah, that'll change. Things they don't fight. Cool. Yeah. Chances know? are that's gonna turn around <clears throat> in a year, two yeah. years. You won't just the same. Just story. give them time. Yeah. Um, just a co couple of comments about the uh, micro mooses um, fan saying. When, when it does well, it seems so easy. When they start to struggle, it's a pain to get them to recover. And Ali is saying, with the micromusa, it's usually a pest, predatory shrimp, fish, or crab, or a mussel inside of the skeleton, dissolving the flesh from the inside out. Uh, that would explain yeah. it. Yeah. There you go. You know, with micromusa, I'll put like four, and one will do good, and the others will just like... <laughs> That's never been my jam, <clears throat> micromusas. I've... I tried them once, did not have success, and uh, never went back. See, what I hate is you look online and you see these people have like a 20-gallon or like smaller tanks, just the fattest. Yeah. You know, what did we used to call them? Like, like oh, uh, and yeah, Lord Howensis, yeah. you know, all this. Yeah. And you just, he's like, you know, quadruple color and, and they're fat. And, you know, here I am, 30 years of experience. I'm crying, looking at your tank, like, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and what is your you know i don't know what are you asking me look at your that's, tank you know they're showing it when it's looking good right and who yeah. knows for how long <laughs> it was looking good <laughs> <laughs> see and that's what i tell some people too i hate it because like i saw this this tank on the internet and it's like dude you don't see them a year from now six no. months from now like, yeah that the, the picture is a snapshot of a moment in time you know yeah i hear you i remember hey, on julian sprung and dilbeek's first book this is old school. I remember, I think that tank that he put on that cover was like only a 15 gallon where he had oh, like really? a, a Crocea or a Maxima like nestled into it. And and uh, I remember for, I don't know how many other people remember this, but I remember them talking like Fama Magazine and at, you know, old old places we used to go, that people sort of accused him of like staging the photo because it was a, that was a damn impressive tank in the mid 90s, you know? Yeah. And they're like, oh, you staged that, and you jammed all that stuff in there. And it's like, I don't know. I know. that I, I, I have that volume around here. So, oh, hold it. What do we got here? This is, uh... Hey, you people in the chat, if you want more of this, make Keith happy. Is that? Yeah, that's there, it. there you right? go. Yeah. That's what we're yep. talking about. That's a 15-gallon oh. tank? Uh, if memory serves me correctly. Wow. Where's Julian in, in, this, in the chat giving you $50 <laughs> super chat? <laughs> No, I'm I'm trying Box to get little, I'm trying to get him and Charles back on as guests. It's challenging. Little fishies products from Julian Sprung. Yeah. Come on, um, get on that. ACIC, our powder blues range from three to ten years old. Really? Oh, here we, here we go, Chris with the Chris just shooting me down in flames. <laughs> Chris, that's what Chris is doing. Chris is like, I have three of them in a nano tank. Jay, damn it, Chris. Jason Langer. Ben is a self-confessed Julian Stoss talker. <laughs> totally, totally. It, you know, okay. Here's a little a funny thing here. Now, I've, now that I've known Julian now for so many years in this and that, and I still get a little fanboy around Julian. 
But I remember there was it was several years ago, but I was walking up the stairs and Julian was coming up and he goes, Ben. And I, I can't tell you when you really think highly of someone. I was just like, I remember in 1995 when I was reading his book, I had no idea I was ever even going to meet him or know him. And then the point where I know he he says my name and he knows who he is, it just like blows your mind. That's my that's my reef industry heroes, Julian Sprung, all day. Yeah, long. I, I I have a story. Uh, you know, I he used to like write the uh, what was in the column uh, reef notes or something. Notes. Yeah, and and uh, so I wrote him a letter once uh, a long oh. time ago. <laughs> Do you think it made it into? I have the the four book set. Really? Where he yeah. And he he book. replied to my letter. Oh, I'm gonna go find yeah. it. Yeah. Um, You're probably like, how do you do a water change? <laughs> I, I can't remember what I asked. I I, I honestly, yeah. and I'm not sure I saved it. So I would I would definitely like to see if you uh, if you could find that to uh, to see exactly oh. what I asked him. But uh, I don't know. It'll be chemical hammer. It's not reef bum. I, I wasn't reef yeah. bum back then. <laughs> yeah, your reef baby. <laughs> that was a persona that I, you know, didn't have uh, back in my early reef keeping uh, days. Um, man, Julian is such a nice guy for sure. Um, oh yeah. Uh, Brennan's reef. Want to know something funny? I have no issue with micromusa and acros in my current tank, but my zoas always struggle for uh, struggle laugh out uh, for the life of me. Can't figure out why zoas really. I've I've always had. Zoas have always grown too fast for me. They've been sort of like a pest coral that I, I kind of like now don't keep in my display tanks. I guess I guess that's the one of the beauties of this hobby as well because you get all of us that have like you know more experience than some of these people have been alive, and it's like I suck with zoas, you suck with micromusa, this person sucks with the, and we're all trying to we're all trying to find our way around that and. Who knows? Maybe if it's in a pest that's in your one system. Yeah. You know, maybe you set up a new tank and then all of a sudden you do better with them. It's hard to cookie cutter it. Just because I have a successful reef tank over here, I can't like duplicate all this over here. And and I'm telling you, it doesn't. I mean, as a professional installer, that's what I want to do. Right. I made a successful reef tank with this equipment. Oh, cool. I'll do that again. Do it over here. Bombs. It's just not like you that. know. Uh, John Wright's asking about fox faces. Ate all my zoas. <clears throat> um, I know fox faces. I have a fox face in every one of my frag tanks for algae reasons, and they're great in terms of I think eating bubble algae. Do you have any mm-hmm. issues you, uh, putting fox faces in in uh, your clients' tanks? I know I love fox face because they got that. They have that yellow, that nice yellow in them, but they're a hardy fish. Yeah. I do know when they get bigger, they can get a little nippy. Yeah. On, 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 on corals, yeah. So it's hard to say. Um, I do have a. He must be ten years old. I have a ten-year-old uh, fox face out there in one of my best tanks, and uh, um, I don't know. He's fine. Yeah. You know, try to keep an eye on him. But I think they're good utility fish. And I mean, you know, in, in my frag tanks, which are all SPS frags, they uh, they're model citizens. So, yeah. you know, are you talking about LPS in terms of them potentially being, um, you know, picking on stuff? There's also an occurrence that I sometimes wonder about where, uh, you know, when I worked in stores and I'll sell, say people like, I watched my yellowtail blue tang eat my corals. And so, I, you know, I don't, I don't dispute that. But I've also wondered, too, especially with algae eating type fish, you know, do you have zoanthids and there's algae amongst it? And what you're seeing is that tang eat, trying to get around that zoa or whatever and eat the algae and maybe accidentally nip the zoa or bother the zoa or whatever LPS that it is. I'm not disputing it, but I'm also saying there's other reasons why that fish could be around there. Looks like they're eating it. That's like that's like when uh, um, people say, my my serpent starfish killed my yeah, angel. Yeah, I know. I promise you, That's it didn't bullshit. kill it. There's... Well, then why did why was he laying on it? He's dead. He's a scavenger. Yeah, you know. Yeah. My, I've I've even had to like my snail killed my tang, and it's like, <laughs> ma'am, I assure you, a snail unless it's a cone snail cannot kill anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. That's like uh, they're just uh, they're 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 feasting on what's uh, you know the uh, easiest meal, so they're dead. You have to be careful because sometimes people get, you know, in a retail 
situations before i'd had people get upset no that's not no i watched it okay you're gonna listen to me or you're gonna make up stories <laughs> yeah. all right dude so i've got this um uh puppy here that i need to take out i think he needs to pee so that's that's a lovely excuse i think you are the one that needs to pee. <laughs> well that goes beyond saying you know but yeah now i'm i'm uh i'm babysitting my daughter's uh golden retriever here and he's uh he's licking my hand and i think he's he's giving me a sign to like uh we need to like uh, go out and uh, take care of some business you know, the, you know the real reef beef move is do like that astronaut did and wear like a, a diaper it depends <laughs> you're just doing do like a six Put hour a diaper reef. on the dog no on, on yourself oh and the dog too. <laughs> and just you know just just Five hour reef bum marathon, and you're just peeing in there and everything. Here, Cooper, come here. Say hi to everybody. Cooper, come here. Come here, Cooper. Cooper, Keith is lying, right? You don't have to pee. He's like, I don't have to pee. This dude just wants to go. <laughs> Cooper, there he is, a good boy. Um, all right, dude. Well, listen, I guess we're going to wrap it up. Um, okay. I'm blaming it on Cooper, but, um, you know, partly because of me. And I got to go to bed. I know. I got <laughs> <laughs> any last words man anything you want to plug reef beef uh hey reefers out there go slow yeah that's awesome quit, advice quit jacking with your tank so much yeah yeah and um bahama lama court remy said yeah everybody see it restock right you're gonna be there hell yeah i might be there there you go the there no you go you're, the you're not skied there <laughs> I want to see you get off the plane with skis on your feet. That would be a challenge. That would be tough. I think uh, I would be, uh, I, yeah, don't think that's going to. You didn't stipulate that there had to be snow. You just want to ski every so if day. I ski so if, down, if I ski you know, down the ramp from the airplane, yeah. then that counts? Or just do all of reef stock with skis on. Just walk just sideways walk around down. with skis and my ski boots? Yeah. That'll okay. work, right? Yeah, that's a day of skiing. Okay. It is Colorado. Well, if there's snow on the ground, you know, in Denver. Yeah. Or, or rollerblade. Like, how technical are you trying to be? You could put on some, <laughs> some denim Daisy Dukes and just rollerblade around the aisles. You'd get a lot of super chats. Dude, I don't way. think we want to even imagine what that would look like. <laughs> yeah, some old man legs. <laughs> All right, man. Ben, this was a lot of fun. I always enjoy having you on. I appreciate you, man. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll see you this weekend on a reef stock with my skis. <laughs> and if, if anyone watching this has never seen uh, reef beef, uh, go find reef beef. It is well worth uh, watching. Both uh, Ben and Rich are uh, not only entertaining, but very you know informative. So it is well worth the time spent. So I want to thank Ben for being on the live stream and also want to thank both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. <laughs> one more time with the hearts. <laughs> for... I wish I knew a third one, but I don't. <laughs> Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for, for sponsoring the, uh, the live stream and also want to thank everybody out there for tuning in and uh, participating via the chat. Also want a big thank you to Paul, who is the moderator as well as the president of the Boston Reefer Society. Please join and support your local reefing clubs. They are so important to this hobby. I also want to let you know that all episodes of Rap on the Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Rap on the Reef Bum live stream will be next Tuesday, March 5th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to have Claude Schumacher, Schumacher back on from Fauna Marine, so that should be another great uh, show. Check out the full upcoming schedule of all guests on ReefBum.com under the YouTube section. Until next time, be safe and be well. Later.